What is God? Part two, FAQs and objections. Make sure you go watch part one of this mini series where we cover the foundations of what God is. Otherwise, you're going to be very lost here. But uh, after I released part one, I gathered a lot of great questions and objections from you guys, which I'll be answering right now. Probably over 50 of them, maybe close to even 80 different questions. Some really good ones here. So let's dig right in. After we answer all these, God should be very clear for you. All right. The first question is, Leo, are you saying that I'm part of God or that I am God? I'm saying that you are God, but also you are part of God. So it depends on what you define you as in that sentence. So if you're meaning you in the conventional sense of you, as you think of yourself, this biological creature that was born, the ego mind, in other words, that you is a part of God. But the deeper you, the you that you will discover after awakening through self-inquiry, through yoga, through meditation, that you, the, the ultimate you, the self with a capital S, that thing is God proper, fully God, not just a part of God. And sometimes I hear this objection from people who do spiritual work or who are religious, and they say, well, yeah, okay, Leo, I buy the, the fact that maybe I'm part of God, but now you're going too far by saying that I actually am God. I'm not actually God. I'm just a part of God. That's what you mean, right? And again, I'm telling you, no. If you go deep enough with your consciousness work, if you become fully awake, what you'll realize is that you literally are the whole of God. That's a radical statement that many orthodox, exoteric religious teachings do not tell you, which is why it confuses people. Um, but nevertheless, it is the case. You just need to go very deep into your um, realization of God. And usually when you first start to realize God, you might start to realize that you're part of God, but not yet realize that you're the whole of God. So that just requires going deeper and doing more work. Next question. Leo, if I'm God, why don't I experience it or feel it? After all, if God is real, why can't we see it? This requires a little bit of explanation because it is tricky. See, God is a trickster by his very nature. And why is that? Because trickery or illusion is the substance of reality, what you know of as reality. You know, you've taken reality for granted your whole life and you just assume that reality is just a given. Well, turns out reality is not a given. Reality is only possible when you imagine that it's possible and you believe in it, in a sense. So you have to trick yourself in order to experience reality in the solid, concrete, physical way that you do. So, in fact, you are experiencing God right now. You've been experiencing God your entire life. The entire universe is God. So you've been looking at it the whole time. The problem with God, though, is that it's so total that precisely because its totality is absolute, there's nothing beyond it, there's nothing outside of it, it encompasses absolutely everything. It's because of this that when you are born as a human being, you mistake God for this little physical reality that you're in right now. And this happens because of the sense of ego or the sense of self that you have. And this sense of self is what helps you to survive. So you are in God all the time, but you're not realizing it precisely because it's not important to your survival for you to be able to be conscious of God to clean your dishes, to wake up in the morning, to go to school, to go to work, to have sex, to earn money, to raise a family, to buy a house, and to maintain all of that. 
it turns out that you don't need to be conscious of God. In fact, being conscious of God in a certain sense hinders those things because a lot of those things are uh, predicated upon lies and illusion. You know, it's hard to, to devote your whole life to earning billions of dollars if you're conscious enough to realize that money is an illusion. So, uh, you have to appreciate that the substance out of which everything is made is actually completely irrelevant to you in your everyday life, which is why you ignore it. You sort of factor it out, right? Because God is the common denominator between all things, that's precisely why you can factor it out. Your mind filters it out because you don't, you don't notice anything but God. So then what's the point of even talking about God if everything is God? Well, of course, you can become conscious that it's all God, and that's a very significant thing to become conscious of. That radically changes how you see the whole world. So it's not just a word game. So you're seeing it right now. Reality. This is it. But you're not conscious of what it is. Next question. Leo, why is God hiding from us? Why is God so tricky? After all, if God is good, good with a capital G like you said before, uh, why would God be so deceptive? It seems like God should be honest and straightforward rather than tricky. Well, you have to appreciate, though, that if God was totally honest and straightforward and not tricky, then you couldn't exist. You couldn't be born. Because for you to be born, you have to be born as a lie, as a trick, as a deception. You see? God is hiding from us precisely because God is a shapeshifter. It's God's very nature to be formless and then also to materialize all form. So think of God as an infinite chameleon. God takes the shape of a, of a Pepsi bottle, of an apple, of a tree, of a car, of a house, of a man, of a woman of something beautiful, of something ugly, of something good, of something evil. As you, of course, as well. God is taking all of these shapes because God's most essential nature, the nature of the Godhead, is pure formlessness, pure potentiality. From this potentiality, all form precipitates or emerges. So before any form can precipitate a human body or an atom or a car or a tree or the planet or a galaxy or the Big Bang or anything. All of that is form. Before that can precipitate, it has to start as pure potential, emptiness. And so that's the Godhead. But then because God is a shapeshifter and takes all of these different forms, then it's difficult to spot because you confuse the form for a physical object precisely because God is so, so good at shape-shifting. It's perfect at it. So when God turns itself into a, a Pepsi bottle, you really believe, oh, that's just a Pepsi bottle. Or when God transforms itself into a physical planet, you believe like, oh, that's a physical planet. No, that's God playing a really good disguise. And that's why it's tricky. Now you might wonder, well, why does it need to do that? Well, like I said before, because there's actually no difference between illusion and reality. This is how God creates. This is the very mechanism of the creation of anything. Appearance is reality. The illusion is all you can have. If you insist on having no illusions, that's okay. You can do that. You can go into a deep meditative state where you can expunge all illusions, all sensory data, and what you'll end up with is just pure nothingness. And you'll be conscious as that nothingness. The entire universe will be expunged. And then you come back into the world of form. You can do that. And you can realize that both are actually the same thing. The world of form and the world of formlessness, when you're in that meditative state, they're not, they're not really different. You can merge those two together to realize that it's all actually uh, one seamless whole. 
And so what we call our formed physical world is, is a constant, never-ending process of things emerging, forms emerging out of formlessness. Like every word that I'm saying is form emerging out of formlessness. It's happening all the time right now. That is what reality is. So God is not uh, somehow bad or evil for, for being tricky. It's just the nature of creation that it must be tricky. Next question. Leo, how, come, uh, well, how convenient is it for you to claim that God is this invisible being? Because this lets you be very unscientific. Because it seems like it's impossible then to falsify your God. So is your claim in God falsifiable? And if it isn't, then isn't it just fantasy? <laughs> Look, uh, at some point, like we said before, you have to get to rock bottom of what is true and what reality is, and you have to accept it for what it is. And if you get to the rock bottom of reality and you discover that there's an invisible being there, you have to accept that as it is rather than arguing like, oh, well, how convenient that it's an invisible being. It just is what it is. You can't justify it any further. It's not a matter of convenience. It's actually highly inconvenient that this being is invisible because it's very challenging to find this invisible being. And yet, of course, it is possible to find it. It is you. Just search deeper inside yourself and feel that invisible being inside of you. I mean, after all, what are you? Can you point to yourself? Your body is not what you really are. You believe you're inside the body. You believe you're an observer inside the body, but what is that observer? Well, it's some invisible being, which of course is God, <laughs> right? So that invisible being was there the whole time. Now, is my claim in God falsifiable? Uh, well, strictly speaking, not. Uh, but you have to understand why that is. It's not falsifiable because God is pure truth. You can't falsify that which is true. You see, a lot of rationalists, materialists, and atheists, they get hung up on this notion of falsifiability. Someone taught them this silly notion that everything must be falsifiable. Anything scientific and valid must be falsifiable. Um, and that any theory that's not falsifiable is somehow bad and somehow superstitious and mystical. Um, there's some import to that within science, and it's good to be empirical when you can. But like we said before, God is, is prior to empiricism and prior to science. And it's prior to the notion of falsifiability. Theories are falsifiable. God is not a theory. God is pure truth. You have to be open to the possibility that there is such a thing as pure truth and that you can directly access it using your consciousness. At least give it a shot and see whether that's possible. So rather than God being falsifiable, because you can't falsify the truth, what God is, is uh, verifiable. You can verify what I'm saying. So that's what makes my claim in God different than just some blind faith or some superstition. I'm actually challenging you to verify the things that I'm saying. You can't falsify the things that I'm saying because they're true. <laughs> so how can you falsify it? You can only verify it. So there are actual experiential correlates to the things that I'm saying, which means that you've got to do the practices, and by doing the practices, you can actually have some of these mystical states and various ex uh, experiences, and then ultimately you reach the absolute truth, and that is self-validating. And at that moment, you discover that actually... There is nothing but absolute truth. Everything that's ever happened to you has always been absolute truth. You just weren't conscious of it. There actually is no such thing as falsehood. There is only truth. God is absolute truth. Falsehood doesn't exist. Only delusion exists, which is really what you think of as falsehood. Next question. Leo, but isn't it the burden of proof? Isn't the burden of proof on you to prove that there is a God? Why are you making me prove some of your silly claims? You should be doing it. 
Well, we already addressed the, the issue of proof and the challenges of it in that you can't actually prove truth because truth is prior to proof. Uh, we talked about in the part one, about that in part one. But, um, but see, again, uh, a lot of people like to call themselves skeptics, so-called skeptics, and they use skepticism falsely. And they go around demanding proof from other people for various sorts of things. Expecting absolute truth to just be delivered to you on a silver platter. Well, that's not going to fly. As it turns out, if you really care about the truth, you need to be willing to actually go and validate it for yourself. That's how this works. So if you're too lazy or you're too skeptical to take on the burden of the responsibility of discovering what is ultimately true about the universe, where the whole universe came from, if you want to cut through all the illusions of social conditioning and everything you've been taught and indoctrinated with in school and by your parents and by religion and by science and by academia and by philosophy, if you want to cut through all that, that's going to be a personal journey that you go on. Truth-seeking, it's called. This is the spiritual quest. It's the quest of seeking the truth. This is the ultimate hero's journey, is finding the truth. The Holy Grail is the truth. And that's going to take a lot of work from you. And you need to take responsibility for that. Don't expect other people to deliver it to you. I'm doing you a huge favor compiling all this information in such an easy to, to digest and clear cut fashion. By no means am I obligated to do that for you. And by no means am I uh, going to bend over backwards and waste a bunch of my time to try to convince you in your stubborn skepticism and cynicism that there is a God. Ultimately, no one can force you to see the truth unless you're willing to go and find it yourself. That's how truth works. Even though truth is true, and in that sense, it's unquestionable, it's very easy for the human mind to ignore or to deny or to resist the truth simply by being closed-minded or cynical or skeptical. Very easy. And that's the whole trap of false skepticism that I've talked about before. See, people falsely assume that, well, if it's the truth, then it should just overwhelm me and I should be uh, unable to deny it. No. <laughs> Uh, your mind is very good at denying stuff. It's an expert at it. Your entire life, you've been denying truth. And so, um, nothing in the world can prevent you from denying truth. You can take the most powerful psychedelics that revealed the truth to you in minutes. But if you're really adamant on denying it, you can deny it. You'll go through hell, but you can deny it. You can read and watch all the best videos and books about truth. And if you're stubborn, you can deny it. And that's exactly what people do. And I've addressed that in my mini series on self-deception. You have to really appreciate the power of self-deception. The power of self-deception is total. And in a sense, that is the power of God. So we talk about God being all powerful. Well, God is so powerful that God, it turns out, is capable of deceiving itself that it's not God. Now that takes real power to be able to do that. But also at the same time, God also has enough power to overcome that deception. But of course, that's going to take some work, which is why awakening is possible. So God has power in both directions. God has the power to fully deceive itself and God has the power to awaken itself through all that infinite deception. And that's the game we're playing here in life. So it's sort of tug of war. This battle between truth and delusion. Next question. But Leo, aren't you just saying that God works in mysterious ways? Aren't you just making the old God of the gaps argument? And you're just taking those areas of science where science hasn't figured out all the answers yet, because, you know, science is honest. Science admits that it doesn't know everything. And so now, because of that, you're exploiting that, that little loophole within science, and now you're stuffing God into those gaps. 
Um, uh, this is how the atheist thinks. This is how the atheist defends his position. The reality is, is that God does work in mysterious ways. Reality is a mystery. Science is in the business of demystifying reality, and it succeeds to some extent, but like I said before in part one, it never fully succeeds, nor will it ever fully succeed, because the bottom line is, is that reality is infinite. There's infinite form, infinite things for science to study, so science will never complete its mission of demystifying reality. And in fact, the more it tries, the more deluded it becomes. Because actually by explaining one piece of reality in terms of another piece of reality, you're missing the total mystery of it all. So, in a sense, God is the gap. God is the nothingness in between all the surfaces. So, you know, if you take an apple and you cut it in half, what do you get? You get more surfaces. You cut that in half, more surfaces more surfaces. You cut the cells of the apple in half, just more surfaces. You cut those in half, you get atoms. Cut those in half, you get other things. Always surfaces. No substance. Have you noticed this? There's no substance to anything within reality. Just surfaces. So what is the substance then of reality? It's nothing. It's the gap. It's the emptiness between the surfaces that unifies all the surfaces into a oneness. That's what you're missing. Next question. Leo, you say that God is nothing, but isn't that the same as atheism? You know, as an atheist, I also believe that God is nothing. There is no God. What is it that the atheist or the materialist is missing? Is there any practical difference between what you're saying and what I believe as an atheist? There's enormous practical difference, and I will give you a, li a list of it right now, of, of the most important components. Um, but when I say God is nothing, that is not what the atheist means. That is not what the atheist believes. This is a different kind of nothing than the nothing that you imagine. It's a nothing that exists, and you can become conscious of it, which is not what the atheist holds. So here is what the atheist and the materialist is not actually recognizing about reality, which he will recognize once he becomes conscious of God. He's not recognizing that objective physical reality doesn't actually exist. The atheist and the materialist is fully bought into the illusion of objective physical reality. And that's, that's a huge thing to deconstruct and to see through. Try to understand how huge that is right there. But that's only one point. Another point is that the atheist is not recognizing that reality is relative and subjective. There is no such thing as objectivity the way the atheist or materialist uh, believes. There is only your subjective experience. That's what reality boils down to, and reality is relative. There is no way that reality is. Reality is however you hold it. That's very twisted, and that, that confuses a lot of people. Another point that the atheist doesn't recognize is that there are no human beings. Human beings don't exist. What you call human beings and the thing that you think you are as a human being, this is the universe being sentient of itself. This is God consciousness that you've confused for human beings. Other people, your parents, these are all figments of God's imagination. And that's a very shocking thing to discover, to discover that your parents never existed, for example. That's not a joke. It's not a word game. That's a shocking insight. I remember when I had this insight uh, about a year ago, like uh, it, it, it startled me so much that for the rest of the day, I had to actually contact somebody, somebody that I knew, uh, a friend of mine who was 
enlightened, I had to contact him and, and just double check with him <laughs> whether this is correct because I couldn't like I couldn't just accept it. It was unacceptable. So at the on the one hand, I I became conscious of it, but I couldn't yet accept it. The ego couldn't accept it. But then, of course, what made the situation even more worse was that, of course, uh, this friend that I was contacting was also just a figment of my imagination. So I felt completely alone. There was nobody I could ask. I felt like I was going insane, like I was losing my mind. Quite scary. That's a very significant insight that you're not recognizing as an atheist. See, as an atheist, you think you're so skeptical. Well, you're not skeptical of the existence of your parents, are you? See, You've never really questioned that, have you? Of course not. Because as a skeptic, all you're doing, you're just buying into all the scientific uh, materialistic beliefs that society has taught you. You didn't ever question them. You're not skeptical about them. Your skepticism is bullshit. That's what it is. It's just a smokescreen. Another thing the atheist doesn't recognize is that reality is sentient, intelligent, alive, and amechanical. This is big. Because the atheist believes in a dumb, brute force physical reality. A mechanical reality where things happen mechanically as though inside of a computer. That is not how reality is. The sentience that you feel inside of yourself, your own personal intelligence, your own aliveness that you feel, that is not yours as a human being. That is the universe. The universe is sentient. The universe is intelligent and alive, and you are just a little piece of that. That's a big reframing of <laughs> how you see reality when you realize that. That's huge. And also when you realize that reality is amechanical. It's not a clockwork. This is really hard for scientifically minded people to wrap their mind around because they their, their mind around because they expect reality to be a mechanical system with simple linear causes and effects, but that's not how it works. Reality is one spontaneous occurrence. Therefore, you can't explain it through any mechanical process because there is no process. It's instant. It's direct. Nothing is really happening through a process. Think of the entire universe as just being one solid block of stuff that has existed for eternity. There is no process to it. It's just there. It's being. Being is amechanical. And this is a radically different way of looking at the world. The atheist is also not recognizing the importance of love. See, the atheist treats love as though it's a, it's a petty human emotion, feelings over facts, some new agey, sappy concept, some religious mumbo jumbo, some girly thing. The atheist is not recognizing that being is love. Everything that's happening here, physically, the physical substance of existence is made of love. And that's really difficult for the, for the atheist to understand because the atheist thinks of love as just an emotion within the human brain somewhere. Not recognizing the centrality of love to everything that's going on, to the centrality of love to evolution, for example. The atheist doesn't understand this. It's completely outside his of his uh, paradigm. The atheist also doesn't recognize oneness. The atheist thinks of the world as being fragmented, a bunch of physical objects all separate from each other that just exist independently, that come into and out of existence. The atheist doesn't understand the literal oneness of reality and his own deep personal connection with the oneness. As a scientist, you're not sitting outside the universe observing it objectively. You are intimately in the universe. Which is how you can know the universe at all. You're not really interfacing with the universe through perceptions. You are the universe. There is no veil between you and the universe the way that science tells you. 
That's a huge epiphany. Another thing the atheist doesn't recognize is that space, time, past, future, matter, energy, cause and effect, birth and death are all illusions. That's huge. That's huge. Your whole life is made out of those things. Now, of course, you might say, oh, Leo, yeah, I know that, I know that time is an illusion because I've read some Einstein and he says time is relative and space-time and all this, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah, yeah, you know that intellectually, but you're not actually conscious that there is no such thing as time or space or past or future or matter or energy or cause and effect or even your birth and your death. You believe in your birth. You believe in your death. You believe in cause and effect. You believe you can explain reality through causes and effects. You believe in matter and energy and you believe in a physical, three-dimensional, four-dimensional universe, whatever it is, or 20-dimensional, 12-dimensional string theory. It doesn't matter. See, you're still believing in that. And to realize that all of those are concepts, that's a huge difference between the way you used to look at the world and the way you see the world now after you've awoken to God. The atheist doesn't recognize higher states of consciousness. The atheist operates as though his state of consciousness is the best one, the highest one from which everything can be understood. You recognize, right, that all of your skepticism and all of your questions and all your doubts is coming from your current state of consciousness, such that if we just change your state of consciousness even a little bit, that all of your doubts and fears and concerns will change. You recognize that science is completely contingent on your current state of consciousness. If your state of consciousness was even a little bit different, your entire science would change. There would be a new physics. The materialist and atheist doesn't understand this. Uh, the atheist doesn't recognize that consciousness is not a byproduct of the brain. This is a huge trap for virtually all materialists and atheists. They don't recognize that the brain is something happening within consciousness rather than the other way around. I've talked about that before at length in my episode, Why Brains Do Not Exist. Go check that out if you're interested in more details on that. Uh, the atheist doesn't recognize that science is limited. The atheist assumes that scientific method can be used like a hammer to hammer everything. You know, when you've got a hammer, everything looks like a nail. That old saying, well, that's how the atheist treats science. Assuming that science will be able to understand everything, including God. Well, turns out you can't do that. Science has certain limits, certain epistemic limits that you must take seriously. And if you want to understand God, you got to go beyond science and use other methods that are outside of science. And see, many atheists aren't open to that because to them, they just assume that science is supposed to be able to resolve everything. Well, that turns out to be a false assumption. Of course, that assumption was never scientific. Can you prove to me that science is capable of resolving every question? Of course not. That's a completely unscientific claim. That's a philosophical, uh, quasi-religious claim. It's a dogma. Atheists also don't recognize the uh, existence of paranormal phenomena. That's a deep topic that I can't elaborate upon too much here. Go check out my episode called um, Making Sense of Paranormal Phenomena. But basically, there are paranormal phenomena at the transrational levels, at higher stages of consciousness, or sorry, at higher states of consciousness, you can access various kinds of paranormal phenomena, which generally materialist science denies. It's in denial about it, even though there's lots of good studies that, that show possibilities for telepathy and remote viewing and clairvoyance and uh, channeling and other sorts of interesting phenomena like that. The atheist doesn't recognize that he created himself. See, the atheist believes that he's just like a, a thing, like a, a, what, I guess, you're a little embryo that was born from, a, from another creature, and that creature was born from some other creature, from some ape, from some something else. Not recognizing that actually you created yourself as God. That's a huge mindfuck right there to realize that. Uh, the atheist doesn't recognize that all dualities that he uses to understand the world with, and all knowledge, all science is man-made, conceptual, 
and man-made, not objective truth. That's a, that has huge ramifications for how we do science and how we um, do high-quality knowledge. The atheist doesn't recognize that he is God, <laughs> of course. The elephant in the room, you are God. You're missing that as the atheist. Even if you agree with everything I'm saying right now, you're still missing the fact that you're God. You're not conscious of it. The atheist is also not recognizing that reality has no limits. Outside of the physical universe, outside of the Big Bang, there is an infinite sea of possibilities where anything is possible. You're not bound by any physical laws. You're not bound by the speed of light. You're not bound by gravity. You're not bound by any universal constants. It's literally infinite out there. And in this infinity, everything is possible. Any kind of rules, any kind of logic, there are no limits. The universe doesn't have to obey some sort of logical or scientific rules that you have discovered as a scientist. I mean, those can be valid within the current state of consciousness that we're in, but when you change your state of consciousness, all those rules fly out the window. And the state of consciousness can be anything you want. There are infinite number of states of consciousness. Next question. Leo, can God be a hallucination or a delusion? And the answer is no. Of course, you can certainly be deluded that you are conscious of God. That's possible. You can trick yourself. You can convince yourself that you did experience God when actually you didn't. That's possible. But when you actually become directly conscious of God, that is unmistakable because God is the absolute truth. You become conscious of the absolute truth through no intermediary. Not through language, not through symbols, not through perceptions, not even through experience per se, but directly. Imagine that there is an absolute truth and that you have become the literal absolute truth. So there is no doubt possible at that point. You got to understand that doubt and the possibility of delusion and the possibility of even hallucination is only possible when you're not directly interfaced with the absolute truth. When you have a mind that can think and come up with ideas of hallucinations or delusions, none of that applies when you're actually present and fully conscious of the absolute truth. The reason this objection comes up that God could be a hallucination is because of this next objection, which is, Leo, but couldn't God just be a brain state? After all, I mean, you take psychedelics, Leo, and you say 5-MeO-DMT can give you experiences of God. So doesn't that actually prove my point, Leo? Because if you can take a chemical, a neurotransmitter, which is what 5-MeO-DMT is, um, supposedly that affects your brain and that gives you an experience of God. So doesn't that prove that God is just some chemical? No, it doesn't prove that. Not at all. Um, what you're not understanding is that all of it is consciousness. The brain is consciousness. The chemical 5-MeO-DMT that you're taking is consciousness, so it's consciousness interacting with consciousness. That's what it is. And what happens with you after you take 5-MeO-DMT is so radical and flips your reality so inside out that you forget you ever had a brain. You forget that chemicals existed. You forget that the universe ever existed. And what you realize is you realize that the 5-MeO-DMT is not a brain state, and it's not a chemical, and it's not a neurotransmitter. What it is, is it's God. Actual God is what it is. But you can only understand just how profound what I just said is if you go through the experience of it. See, you can't sit here in your current state of consciousness where you believe in brains and in chemicals and you believe that consciousness is a, a, a phenomenon of the brain. Um, uh, see, while you have all these concepts and ideas and beliefs, what I'm saying makes no sense. And so from your perspective, yeah, God can be a hallucination or a brain state. But when you actually become conscious of God, you realize that God has nothing to do with the brain and it's not even a state. It's not even an experience. It's not a hallucination. It's not a delusion. It's not a perception. It's not anything you've ever known. It's God. It's absolute truth. 
And of course, that's so shocking that it, it ends your whole reality. Your whole reality collapses the moment you realize that. In a way, that's impossible to happen as you're sitting here just listening to me. It has to actually happen to you. Next question. Leo, how can you trust that psychedelics reveal anything true at all? Well, this can't really be explained to you unless you actually go through the process of taking psychedelics in sufficient enough doses that you have a breakthrough experience, and only then will you understand. It's shocking. It seems impossible. And when it happens to you, you'll be saying, this is impossible. It's impossible, and yet it'll be happening to you anyways. Because you see, you you got to stop trusting what you your mind tells you is possible or impossible. Like I said before, everything is possible. Consciousness can do anything. There's nothing that consciousness cannot do because God is omniscient. Consciousness, I mean, not omniscient, but omnipotent, all-powerful. Consciousness is all-powerful. It has no limits. It can imagine anything. It can imagine you taking a psychedelic and arriving at the absolute truth. And that becomes the truth. Be careful about judging and trying to evaluate psychedelics without actually having done them. None of that is correct because you're evaluating, again, going back to the matrix example, you're inside the matrix trying to evaluate things I'm telling you about what's outside the matrix from within the matrix, and that's not going to fly. It's sort of like you're asking, but Leo, you say you've been outside the matrix, but how do you know that you've actually been outside the matrix? And that it wasn't just more matrix. And you think you're being smart by saying this, but actually you're being stupid. Because what you don't realize is that to exit the matrix is not to just exit the matrix into some new space that's similar to the one you left. To exit the matrix is to realize that there is one matrix inside of another matrix inside of another matrix inside of another matrix forever to infinity. That's what the matrix is, is an infinity of matrices one inside the other. You see? And it's to realize that, this meta-truth, that is the realization of God. God is not just some experience outside the matrix. God is the realization that there's nothing but matrix. Up and down, forever. Matrix within matrix. So it's not that the psychedelic shows you some vision of Jesus or some interesting visual phenomena or something like that. The psychedelic reveals to you that it's all a hallucination. It's always a hallucination. Psychedelics show you hallucinations and what you're experiencing right now is a hallucination and there's no difference and there's no possibility but hallucinations. That's what psychedelics reveal to you. It's a meta-truth. It's a truth at a newer, higher level than you've conceived possible. Next question. Leo, could there be something beyond God? For example, could God just be part of some computer simulation? Why do you speak of God as the ultimate? Shouldn't we be open to the possibility that, yeah, okay, even if there is a God and you've experienced it, but there's probably something beyond that too, right? No, you don't get it. You're treating God as, again, as some phenomenon. Like, you go and you see some alien. That's how you're treating God. That's not what God is. What I'm telling you is God is a meta thing. God is the realization of absolute infinity or totality. You have to appreciate when we say the word God, at least when I do, what we're really saying, replace that word God with everything. The word everything is a very special kind of word. It's an elastic word. It's a concept that expands to include more and more stuff. So, for example, if I told you everything, is there anything more I could tell you? No, because I've told you everything. Now you say, oh, Leah, but what about that thing you didn't tell me? No, but the, 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 the notion of everything includes even that thing that you think I didn't tell you. It includes that. 
No, but Leo, but what about that other thing that maybe you forgot? No, the word everything, the concept everything expands because it's elastic to include everything. It's total. The word total also works like that. When you say something is total, that means you leave no piece left out. So when we're saying God, we're saying everything and we're saying totality. When we're saying reality, you might wonder, well, Leo, couldn't there be other realities? No, there couldn't because the notion reality includes everything. If there's two separate realities, what's connecting them? The new reality is that there's two of them. So there's a meta reality that contains the two smaller realities. And you might say, well, but what if there's two meta realities? Right, there are, there are two meta realities and there's a meta meta reality that contains those two and so on to infinity forever until we got everything. You see? So in this way, you can become absolutely clear. You can become absolutely conscious that there is nothing beyond God. God is infinite, which means it goes beyond itself forever. God is the process of beyonding. Beyond, 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 beyond. Infinity to the infinite power, to the infinite power, to the infinite power, to the infinite power, forever, for infinity, forever. It just keeps going and going and going and going and going. That's what the realization of God is. Such that when you understand that, that's it, you're done. You've understood the entirety of everything. There's nothing more to understand, literally. Nothing more is possible. If you're imagining that something more could be possible, you haven't understood what the notion of totality is. Otherwise, you would have included that thing that you excluded. Can God be part of a computer simulation? No, because a computer simulation is a very specific, finite thing. See, to say that it's a computer simulation and not something else presupposes a distinction between two different things. There's a computer simulation on the one side or something else like reality on the other side. But God is the thing that encapsulates both of those. So computer simulations occur within God, but God does not occur within his computer simulation. See? God is not a computer simulation. You've been watching way too much science fiction and you've been too addicted to technology. You gotta drop that shit. God is way more radical than a computer simulation. God is a mechanical, mysterious, in a way that a computer simulation is not. Leo, next question, how do you know that this infinity you're talking about wasn't generated by something else? Well, again, if you're still imagining something else outside of this infinity that could have generated this infinity, you're actually not conscious of infinity. To be actually conscious of infinity you realize that there's nothing outside of infinity. In the same way that, let, let's, let's take the example of, of numbers. So when I'm talking about infinity in, ter in terms of God, I'm not talking about numbers. I'm talking about actual infinity. This very moment right here is actual infinity. But in the, in the, in the example of numbers, you know, we can take the integers. And when I tell you all the numbers, Here we have all the numbers. And you tell me, but couldn't there be some other number outside of all the numbers? No, all the numbers contain all the numbers. The infinity of numbers is all that there is. It already includes any higher number. You can say, well, but Leah, what about the, the billionth, trillionth, trillionth number? You've missed that one. No, I didn't. That's included in infinity. What about the negative numbers? No, that's also included. What about the decimal points? Yeah, that's also included if we want to take, for example, infin the infinity of reals, not just integers. See? And you say, well, what about the imaginary numbers? Well, we can include those too. So take the largest infinity. Stop taking the small infinities. Take the largest infinity. As uh, Georg Cantor said it, the, uh, the absolute infinite set, the infinity of infinities. Take that one. That's what God is.
So you see, it can't be generated by something else because there's nothing else but it. Oneness. When you realize the totality of oneness, you realize that there's nothing but it. Therefore, it had to create itself, and it has to interact only with itself. There's nothing else that God can interact with but itself, which is why God has to be disguising itself, because if God didn't disguise itself and didn't limit itself, then God would be conscious of everything all the time. See? It's sort of like you're trying to play a chess game, but there's only one player, there's only you. So how do you play a chess game when you need two players, but there's only one player? Well, what you could do is you can, if, if you're good enough, you can sort of compartmentalize your mind. And you can like almost be running the chess simulation on like two different parts of your brain. Uh, like maybe on, on, the, on one hemisphere, you're running the black, and on the other hemisphere, you're running the white. And you're trying to compartmentalize those two so that you can't look inside the other one. You know, you can't peek in because you don't want to look at the strategy. You don't want to know like what, what the other player is, is planning because that would eliminate the possibility of surprise. So this is how God generates the ability of surprise is that he tricks himself with these false separations. See? And this is why there can't be two gods or more than two gods. Because absolute infinity or totality or everything, you can't have two everythings. You can't have two totalities. If it's a true totality, it has to be one. See? It's very important to understand how that works. This next question I love. Leo, can God create a rock that he himself cannot lift? I love this question. So here's how it really works. God creates a rock and God creates a human. Certain rocks are small, the human can lift those. Certain rocks are too big, human can't lift those. So there, in that scenario, God created a rock that he himself could not lift. In fact, you are the living uh, in incarnation of this, you are the proof of it. Go outside, find a giant rock that's too heavy for you to lift, and notice that you can't lift it. So you are God trying to lift that rock, but you can't do it. See? So God imposed this limitation on itself. Now you might ask, but Leo, but what about, um, what about God itself? You know, I don't mean God in the human form, I mean just God in its pure form, like the Godhead. Can the Godhead create a rock that it cannot lift? Well, this makes no sense to ask that because the Godhead in its formless state has no form, so it can't lift anything. It can't do anything. In its pure formless state, the Godhead is just infinite potential. So if you want lifting to happen, because lifting only happens within the realm of form, you're talking about creating different forms that can do the lifting, which means you got to create a rock, you got to create a, a surface that the rock is on, you got to create another creature that lifts it, or you got to create a lever that lifts it. And so, in order to do stuff, God has to incarnate itself into some specific form. God has to limit itself. Because, see, when God is truly infinite in his sort of Godhead state, it's so infinite that it can't be a human or an elephant, or a bulldozer, or a crane, or something, because all of those are specific limited things. And God is infinite, so it, it can't have any of those limitations. It has to be unlimited. But it can also limit itself into these various kinds of forms, and then these forms, of course, have real limitations. So a human can lift a bigger rock than an ant can. And, you know, a human has a, a mind. human can invent a bulldozer, or a giant crane, which will help him to lift an even bigger rock. Next question. If God is all-powerful, can he destroy himself? Uh, the answer, generally speaking, is no. Not as the Godhead. Because as the Godhead, God is all-powerful, but it has no form. And so 
destruction is a concept that only makes sense within, within the realm of form. You can destroy a formed object, like a rock, a human, a tree, a planet, a galaxy. You can destroy those, but you can't destroy the vacuum of empty space, so to speak. You see. Um, but God can destroy himself in his incarnated versions. So God incarnates as you, and of course you can easily destroy yourself by jumping off a tall building. If God uh, incarnates itself as a star, the star can get destroyed by getting sucked into some black hole. And that, in fact, is the fate of all forms. All forms get created, and they all get destroyed. No form is permanent. The only permanent thing is formlessness itself, the Godhead. The Godhead is sort of like the head of a fountain that's always spitting out form. Next question. Leo, how do you know that your experiences of God aren't just confirmation bias of stuff that you've read? It's a good question, and you do have to be careful about that, especially when doing psychedelics. Um, but mostly because mm, when you have these absolute samadhi experiences, all of your conceptual knowledge flies out the window. And you're right there in the truth of it. And it's self-validating. Also because these truths, they come as such huge mind fucks, and they hit you so just like out of the blue that they blindside you. And oftentimes, even though maybe you've read about it, even when it hits you, you still don't believe it. You see? It's shocking, like I told you about that example of realizing that there are no others but me, um, that all human beings are unreal. You know, that, that was a shocking, shocking discovery. You can read about that in a book, or you can even hear it from me, but when it actually happens to you and you realize it, you're not going to want to accept it. It's going to be the opposite of confirmation bias. This is scary stuff. And a lot of things that I've become conscious of, when I become conscious of it, it's something I hadn't read about. Or even if I had read about it, it was not something I took seriously or I believed. And then now it actually becomes present in my consciousness. And I'm like, oh, damn, wow. Um, it's, it's way more powerful than anything that I, that I read about it. It's like that. And also because I, I'm very careful to cross-reference my experiences with insights from spiritual texts, various traditions, um, so that I don't get caught in one tradition. Various masters and teachers that I trust who, um, who are very truthful and have crazy degrees of consciousness, I, I, you know, I, I check against their insights to make sure that I'm not tricking myself. Next question, but Leo, aren't you just backwards rationalizing your personal religious beliefs? Aren't you just like a closet Christian or a closet Buddhist? Isn't it that you just want God to be real? which is why you're coming up with all these rationalizations and stories. No, not at all. Like I told you, I was an atheist for most of my life. I had no interest in, in discovering that God was real. Even when I was doing enlightenment work, <clears throat> I still didn't have any intentions of discovering God. Um, I viewed enlightenment as a very sort of um, Buddhist notion of just like nothingness. So, you know, nothing, this isn't God, <laughs> so I thought. Um, so I'm not a closet Christian. I'm not, neither am I a closet Buddhist. Um, I don't subscribe to any religious teaching or tradition. Uh, of course, I study them. I study all the traditions, but um, that's mostly for, for curiosity. Um, I had no religious beliefs until I started having these profound awakening experiences. And what I'm talking about here is not belief. Next question. Leo, how can you be so sure that you're right? Isn't it arrogant and egotistical of you to be here speaking with such authority about these things, with such certainty? Shouldn't we be more humble with our truth claims? Well, that's the nature of absolute truth, is that it's absolutely true. 
under all conditions. So either you're conscious of it or you're not. If you're not conscious of it fully, then you can't understand how absolute truth can be possible. It doesn't make sense to you under your materialist paradigm because under the materialist paradigm, what that paradigm tells you is that you're a living creature which is interfacing with physical objective reality through a veil of perceptions and therefore you never have a possibility of accessing reality itself. But it turns out that that paradigm is wrong and untrue itself. So even though it might seem arrogant and egotistical, it's actually not. Uh, I'm just being honest. And it would actually be um, less honest if I came up here and tried to put on a front of fake humility. When you recognize what God is, you're clear about it. All right? There's no questions or no doubts. It's a certainty. That's the whole value of realizing God. It's not like scientific knowledge. It's not like speculation about the nature of the Big Bang or something. It's not like that. It's a totally different type of thing. You need to experience it to find out what I'm talking about. And until then, it's going to be outside the realm of your credulity. Leo, is it possible to understand or is it possible to misunderstand God, to have a false experience of God? And if so, how can you be sure that you haven't misunderstood God? And now here's where it gets real interesting and tricky, is that yes, it is possible to misunderstand God, and yes, it is possible to have a false experience of God. So then, of course, you wonder, how, how can I be certain that I haven't fallen into this trap? And there's no way to explain it other than that. You have to awaken. When you awaken, you'll know what awakening is. But even so, you can still trick yourself and delude yourself. This is precisely why this whole spiritual domain is so fraught with traps and trickery and self-deception. It's not enough just to have one mystical experience and to think that, well, now I'm immune to self-deception. No. Actually, just by having one little mystical experience now, you actually open yourself up to a whole new realm of, of possible self-deception and misunderstanding, which is exactly why I spend a lot of time cross-referencing various sources, hundreds of sources, um, studying under various kinds of masters and yogis and sages, listening to their wisdom, double-checking, not believing anything, not taking anything on faith, taking a non-dogmatic approach, being conscious of various kinds of self-deception mechanisms, studying myself carefully, contemplating this stuff, journaling about this stuff. You know, this is... Many years of work go into this. And even so, I never claim to be infallible. Um, I'm always open to, to having new revelations, to having certain things recontextualized, maybe reinterpret, fine-tune some stuff. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm always open to that. Because you have to be, because you have to take the possibility of self-deception very seriously. But the actual experience of God is not a self-deception. There's many degrees of it, The highest degrees of it are not a self-deception. Certain lower degrees of it can be quite self-deceptive. Next question, Leo, aren't you just afraid of admitting that you really don't know? What's wrong with just saying we don't know the way that science does? See, science is humble and you're arrogant. Uh, like I said, false humility is no virtue. Saying you don't know is great when it's actually true. But when you really do know something, like if you become conscious of what God is, then saying you don't know is actually a lie and just adds falsehood to the truth that was there. So generally speaking, it's very good to adopt the attitude of I don't know. And so I highly recommend that you adopt that attitude yourself. And there are many things that I don't know. I'm not saying I know everything. I'm just saying I know what God is and that you can know what God is. And it's actually a big 
agnostic mistake to make the claim that we don't know. Because when you make that claim definitively, what you're actually saying is that you know that we don't know and that we can't know. But actually, you don't know that. You see? Not knowing is a tricky thing. You don't know what you don't know. So, you have to be open to the possibility that you could know something very astounding. Precisely because you don't know. The mistake that most scientists make is that they, they limit their realm of possibility so much that when something astounding, some astounding possibility is, um, is put forth, they immediately become very skeptical and very conservative. And they say, well, we can't possibly know something like that. That can't possibly be validated. Forgetting that they don't know whether it's possible to know that. And that some people could actually have broken through to this astounding insight. Next question. Leo, if God is all loving, how come there is evil in the world? Why would God create such a terrible world? Why does so much suffering exist? Isn't there a contradiction between the classic definition of God as being omnipotent and, uh, and good and all loving? And yet we have the existence of evil. So how could a good, all loving, all powerful God allow for so much evil? Well, the answer is that in fact, there is no such thing as evil. Evil doesn't exist. Evil is a projection of your ego mind. The only reason there's evil from your point of view is because you're a limited biological creature from your point of view, and therefore you need to survive. And your whole life is about survival. And what you call evil are those things which threaten your survival. And as a limited formed being within this larger universe, you're very vulnerable to extermination to having your form radically change. When your form radically changes, that's what you call death. And so your entire existence is predicated upon you surviving and fighting to survive. So therefore you've internalized this notion of evil and you really believe that it exists and you really believe suffering exists because suffering is a mechanism, a psychological mechanism within you, which helps you to avoid dangerous situations. That's the function of suffering. So suffering is there because it keeps you alive. If you didn't suffer, if creatures didn't feel pain, then they wouldn't live for very long. And therefore, you wouldn't be here questioning what God is, or what suffering is, or what evil is, or why there's so much evil in the world. You wouldn't exist at all. You would be that infinite formless Godhead, which can't do anything because it's infinite and it's formless which isn't very interesting. So we need to, God needs to incarnate itself into the world. But when it incarnates itself, it makes itself limited. And therefore, it obligates itself to now play the game of survival, which necessitates pain and suffering. So, uh, from God's point of view, there's no such thing as evil. Nothing terrible is happening in the world. The world is perfectly fine and beautiful, and so there's no contradiction at all. In fact, the world is perfect. You can't see it because you're looking at the world through the ego's eyes. So to really drive this point home for you, here's a great analogy. Think about going to the movies. You go to the movies, and as the audience member, you're sitting there in the movie with your popcorn, and you're watching some horror movie or some some action movie where people are getting shot, bad guys are getting shot, and so forth. Now, from the point of view, from, from your point of view, sitting there in the movie theater, you're having fun, you're entertained, even when people are getting shot on the screen. But from the point of view of one of the characters on the movie screen, you can see how that character might say, what kind of sick, evil, twisted person would create such a movie where I get shot and 
my girlfriend gets raped and there's this war and there's this bad guy and there's torture and slavery and all of this stuff and there's blood and there's monsters. You know, what kind of sick human being or sick creator would create a, uh, a horror movie? Why is, why, why is there so much evil? Why is the creator so evil for creating this horror movie? But of course, this is all illusion. It's a fantasy. The movie's not real. So the movie would be terrible if it was real. But because it's an illusion, it's not bad at all. You see, it's all good. So from the point of view, from the higher vantage point of the audience member who's enjoying the movie, there's no problem with a horror movie and monsters and aliens and uh, people killing each other. It's all just fun and entertainment. The trick is not to get sucked into the movie too much. Can you imagine if you were at the movie theater and you were watching this horror movie and like a monster was chasing some little girl in the horror movie and then you, you actually started to believe that this monster is going to eat this little girl? And then when the monster actually does eat the girl in the movie, you actually start crying and you get upset and you get offended. You know, how dare this monster, this monster kill that little girl and he made her suffer. Look at all the pain. And you know, what kind of sick movie director would sacrifice a little girl, a little girl for this monster to feed this monster? How sick is this? You know, and then you'd call the child services. You'd get you get out of the theater. You'd call child services and complain, and you'd you'd write down the the movie director's name. You know, when, when the credits roll, you'd write it down, and then you'd call the police. You'd call the FBI and tell them, you know, this this guy he killed a little girl for this monster. See, it's delusion, literally delusion. And this is exactly what's happening right now in your life. The problem is that you can't, um, you can't believe that this actually applies to your life because, hey, after all, it's your life and your life is the most important thing there is. And death is the, the worst thing that there is. And suffering feels so bad and pain feels so bad. And so you confuse all the suffering and the pain and the idea of death. You confuse all this for reality. And the reason you do that is because you're so goddamn egotistical and selfish. And the reason you are that way is because you had to be in order to be here at all to experience the universe. See? So you're caught in a bind. You are God caught in a bind. You put yourself in this situation. And now you got to live through it until the end. In the same way that, you know, have you ever gone on a roller coaster, like a really epic roller coaster, like the most wicked roller coaster in the whole park. And you get on it with your friends. And you know, at first you're just, you guys are just kind of like talking shit before you get on it. And you're like, oh yeah, yeah, we're gonna go to the, let's get to the biggest roller coaster. Yeah, I want the most epic roller coaster. All this, yeah, we can handle it. And then you get on it. And then the roller coaster's inching up, inching up, inching up to the very top, to the very top, to the very top. And then when you're, when you're at the very top and the roller coaster finally starts to crest and to finally, um, uh, you know, really get juicy um, and your stomach starts to sink. And at that moment, you tell, you tell yourself, holy fuck, what did I get myself into? <laughs> what the fuck is this? Why did I ever agree to this? You see, um, that's exactly what's happening with God and with uh, human beings. We're putting ourselves uh, as God into these situations and we're living through them and it seems very horrible but also at the same time, it's kind of uh, exhilarating and fun. It's like the ultimate virtual reality. A virtual reality where your own life is on the line. Actually kind of like them in the movie The Matrix. You know, I remember when I was 24 years old, uh, for my birthday present, what I wanted was to jump out of an airplane to go skydiving. And so I did. Um, and I did a solo jump. So usually when people go skydiving, they, they jump tandem, which means that they are strapped to the belly of some expert skydiver. And so in that case, it's very easy. You just jump with the skydiver. You're, you're basically attached to the, sky, to the master skydiver's front. And he just you know, pulls the chute and he does everything for you. You just kind of enjoy the ride. <laughs> well, I wanted to jump solo because I was trying to be macho. Um, and so I found a place 
in Dallas that actually allowed solo jumps, which is quite rare. There's only a few places in the U.S. that allow solo jumps for newbies. But they had to, you had to go through a long course, um, like a weekend long course, where they taught you all the all the necessary um, instruction for how to jump solo. Um, and so I went through that whole course, and I was excited about. It. I thought it was going to be all great, and then I jump out of the airplane, and uh, I remember so vividly my my first thought that came to me after I jumped out of the airplane. And, you know, jumping out of the airplane actually wasn't the scary part. Pulling the cord of the parachute, that's the scary part. <laughs> but before I even got to that, um, when I jumped out of the plane, my first thought was, I'm never fucking doing this again if I live. <laughs> and my thought was, why the fuck did I put myself through this? Because <laughs> it was so, um, what they don't tell you is that it's so uncomfortable to jump out of an airplane. It's really cold. You've got this like torrent of air speeding into your face at 120 miles an hour as you're falling down. Um, it's really, really cold. It's like you're in a refrigerator and you're just getting blasted in your face and in your nose and in your mouth with this like torrent of cold air. Imagine someone took a cold water uh, fire hose and just like sprayed you with it for several minutes straight and it was just like pummeling your face. It's really uncomfortable. Um, so I didn't enjoy that part. Mm. And yeah, I promised myself I would never do it again, and I haven't since. And yeah, pulling that cord is the scariest part, because um, you'd be surprised at how many times the parachute fails to open properly. Quite often, you have a reserve chute. The reserve chute is much more reliable than your standard chute. But the standard chute, a lot of times, well, most times it'll open uh, successfully. Very rarely does it not open at all where you have to cut it away. But a lot of times the chute will open, but it won't open properly. It'll get tangled up. One of the cells in the chute will get collapsed and you have to, <laughs> you have to deal with that nightmare while you're descending down. So um, I remember when I was about to pull that, that cord, uh, I was, and at that point, I didn't believe in God at that point. I was an atheist back then. Um, this was before I did any actualized.org stuff. And, uh, yeah, when I was pulling that cord, I was praying to fucking God, to all the gods that I knew. I was praying that that parachute would open successfully. And sure enough, it did. I didn't have any tangles. Um, but it did get caught in my crotch a little bit, and that was kind of painful. But anyways, that's my skydiving experience. So that's, you know, that, that we're, we're addicted to, to excitement. As human beings, we're addicted to excitement, we're addicted to violence, we're addicted to horror, we're addicted to sex, we're addicted to food, we're addicted to pain, we're even addicted to suffering. We enjoy it. Secretly, you love your suffering. You don't want to give up your suffering to be happy. <laughs> if you did, you'd, you'd be awake a long time ago. Next question. Leo, if God is all loving and good, how come God doesn't care if we are murderers, rapists, and so forth. Well, it's actually precisely because God is all loving that it loves everything, and so it doesn't judge. So see, you as an ego, because you care about survival, you judge murder and war and rape and criminality as bad and wrong. But the only reason you judge it as such is because you have something to lose from it, because you've created a certain identity that you need to defend. And you've also created an identity of being moral and good and upright. And so you view yourself as the defender of innocent people against murder and war and rape, right? Of course. And see, so actually, the reason that you don't understand why God doesn't mm, condemn us for these things is because actually you hate murder, war, rape, and criminality. See, you're filled with hatred. You hate these things. But God is all loving. God loves all these things, which is why they exist. If something exists, God loves it. And since everything that there is exists, God loves everything. <laughs> and this is the infinite love of God. But this love is way too radical for you. You're not able to embody this love because you have way too much to lose. Because you have your life riding on the line. You have your children to defend. 
You have your money to defend. You have your company to defend. You have your religion to defend. And so you're not able to be all loving. For you to actually embody true unconditional love, you'd have to be dead, which means you'd have to be God. You'd have to be the Godhead, not God incarnated as a little human being. Or at the very least, you'd have to be conscious that you're a God. And that's exactly what you become conscious of when you become fully awoke. Leo, next question. Leo, if God is infinitely good and loving, as you say, why isn't it also infinitely evil and hateful? Why are you cherry-picking here? It's a good question. It's a good question. Um, because, like I said, evil doesn't really exist. Evil only exists from the ego mind's point of view. So God literally cannot see evil. And there's nothing for God to hate. If God wants to be evil, or if God wants to hate, what God needs to do is to incarnate itself in some limited form. So, for example, in a certain sense, God is evil and hateful, but it's doing it through humanity. See, God loves evil and hate so much that it doesn't mind living through it as a human being. Which is why you're here. Ta-da! You see? God wants to know what it's like to experience getting murdered, getting raped, uh, going to war, getting your arm blown off, being a slave, being in a concentration camp, uh, and every other evil that you can imagine. God wants to know it all. But you probably don't, as a little human being. See? So in a certain sense, God is both infinitely good and loving and also hateful and evil. But, uh, but in another sense, the, the evil and the hate is only visible, so to speak, from a, a limited human point of view. And this is really difficult for people to accept. Spiral dynamic stage blue people just don't want to accept. Many even stage orange people just don't want to accept this. Even stage green people don't want to accept this. They want, they want God to be all loving. And they want God to, to not have anything to do with murder and rape. But you know, murder and rape are creations. They exist. If they exist, where do they come from? What do you think? You think that God created everything except murder and rape? <laughs> that those somehow, he, he wasn't responsible for those. He was responsible for the entire universe. He created the entire earth. But the creatures who are killing and raping each other on this earth, well, he's got nothing to do with that. Of course he does. God created everything, including all the stuff that you think is evil. The trick is, is that it's only evil from your point of view. So, in the ultimate sense, God is just good and loving. Uh, next question. Is there a devil? And if so, did God create the devil? You have to understand what devil means. Devil just refers to the mechanism of survival. Devil refers to the ego. Devil refers to separation, illusion, and falsehood. Not some man with a pointy tail and horns. If you want to know more about what the devil really means... Check out my episode, What is the Devil? So, in a certain sense, there is the devil. You are the devil. The ego is the devil. The thing that's going to die is the devil. Um, and, of course, God created that. Not only did God create the devil, not only did God create the ego, God is the devil. Because, remember, we're talking about oneness, totality. Because of the oneness, there cannot be anything separate from God. You can't separate evil from God, the ego from God, or the devil from God. And now at this point is where the stage blue people just lose it. How dare you, Leo, compare God with the devil when clearly they're opposites. But they can't be opposites because if the devil exists, 
then it's a part of the creation. And if it's a part of creation, who created everything? God. So God created the devil. In fact, really what the devil is is just a disguise of God. See, when, the, when, the, when God incarnates itself into various forms, into various disguises, because it's a sh shapeshifter, it will incarnate itself into devilish forms, which create evil, which are selfish. And, um, and through that, God gets to experience what it's like to be a devil. And that pleases God very much, but it probably doesn't please you or your ego. Next question. Why is mainstream religion so confusing, deluded, and inaccurate? Why can't they explain God in a straightforward manner the way that you're explaining it here, Leo? Why all the silly metaphors? Why do they say that God is separate from me? Why are we told to worship God? Why are we told that God will punish us for being bad? And so forth. Religion is a very tricky thing, and you have to appreciate its origin, where it came from. It's very problematic to evaluate religions like Christianity or Islam from a modern perspective. You have to really look at it from the perspective of 2,000 years ago when these religions were mostly created. Mankind was at a very unsophisticated level of cognitive development back then. There wasn't even such a thing as the notion of science the way we know of it today. Science as we know of it today is really a modern invention, several hundred years old. So this notion of very carefully, analytically, empirically breaking stuff down, I mean, it exists in certain Buddhist traditions and certain yogic traditions, but generally speaking, this is a modern notion. So to expect religions from thousands of years ago to be very precise and scientific and clinical, and also to be very integrative, and uh, also to share modern values, and to not be homophobic, or to not be patriarchal, uh, or to not be moralizing, this is absurd. The era in which these religions sprang forth uh, most people were at spiral dynamic stage purple or red at that time. We're talking about very unsophisticated levels of development. And so religion was a vehicle for promulgating the idea of God. But how do you do that with people who are not scientifically minded? People who are not integral. People who are highly racist and ethnocentric. People who are very closed minded. People who have no sense of the world. Back then, people didn't even... Most people didn't even know that the world was round. Now, of course, the educated people knew, uh, but regular people for whom religion was, was meant, they didn't know. They didn't even know how to read. They didn't know mathematics. Like, they didn't know anything about the world. You have to understand this. So, how do you get these very tribal people to recognize the higher truth of God? Well, you have to couch it in some kind of language that they can understand. So you're going to use metaphors, you're going to use stories. There weren't even printing presses back then. There were no books. You couldn't even print a Bible back then. So, of course, you're going to use various kinds of metaphors and analogies that make sense for that time. And this stuff was passed down oftentimes uh, as stories, not even written down. And of course, as you're doing this, um, the people who are passing it down and then writing it all down, these people are not the most enlightened people. So even though maybe Jesus was very enlightened, you might imagine, or Muhammad was, or the Buddha or somebody else, uh, these people, they didn't write any books, didn't record any videos. So Jesus' story was recorded hundreds of years after the fact. And the people who recorded the story, well, who knows, different people reported different gospels various conflicting accounts. And these people who made these recordings, of course, they might have tried to like get the gist of Jesus down and his teachings, but they themselves, I doubt, were significantly enlightened. And so they're filtering it through their own mind, through their own ethnocentric and maybe sp spiral dynamic stage red or blue worldview. And they're putting it into metaphors and stories that ordinary folks can understand. So, of course, it's going to be confusing and diluted and filled with inaccuracies. Of course. And then, of course, 
uh, the way it works is because these stories get passed down through the ages. It's like a game of telephone where every person talks about God to another person, to another person. And so the knowledge gets further and further removed from the direct awakening experience. And how many of these people actually were able to follow the instructions and the teachings of Jesus and actually have, for example, some massive enlightenment? <laughs> Very few, I would bet. And then how do you talk about it in a way that isn't dogmatic, that isn't overly ethnocentric, that isn't overly moralistic? Because you see, whatever spiral dynamics stage your cognitive level of development is at, when you have these epiphanies and realizations, you're going to filter your experiences of God and understanding of God through that lens. Because you have to bring the truth back down to earth and embody it here within a particular country, within a particular era, within a particular uh, community, within a particular culture. And so uh, because of that, for example, a lot of uh, old religious teachings are very moralistic. And they talk about right and wrong and lawful and unlawful. And, um, and they make various kinds of rules against what you should and what you shouldn't do. Because back then, that was advanced for their time back then. Back then, before there were even countries, before there were legal codes, this was actually an innovation to couch morality and law and to ground it with religion. But you see, of course, also what happened is that uh, all of these religions and spiritual teachings, they become corrupt. The ego and the devil corrupts all these teachings, uses it for its devilish purposes. So, of course, various kinds of countries and nation states, rulers and kings got a hold of these religions, started using them to control the masses, starting using them to justify their own rule and to justify various kinds of um, wars and legal codes and various kinds of things that they wanted for their government. So you see, the ego seizes a powerful tool like religion. If you have a really high-quality spiritual teaching, the ego will seize it, co-opt it, and actually it will become the chief um, tool by which the devil will then spread falsehood, confusion, delusion, and uh, egotism. And so that's exactly what happened, which is why you have to be very careful with religions. And in general, the whole problem with God is that because it's such a, it's such a personal and subjective realization that you can't codify it and you can't spread it through mass means. You can't write uh, a book that's going to spread it. You can't create a video about it. You can try, but people will misunderstand. And then even even if you do a really good job writing a great book or creating a great video, well, some of your followers, they will just be fanatics and they will just believe the stuff. They won't actually do the practices because the practices are too hard for them and they will just believe it. And then uh, after you're dead, um, they're going to create a cult and they're going to perpetuate this ideology. And that's what generally happens with these spiritual teachings. That's why you got to be very careful. And so you have to learn how to read these teachings properly, sort the wheat from the chaff, and you have to be careful to account for the various spiral stages that are present, for example, in the Bible. So when they, when they tell you to stone homosexuals in the Bible or something like this, you know, you have to be able to say, okay, well, that, that's old, old style thinking from 2,000 years ago. We don't do that today. <laughs> right? You don't want to take that part seriously. But then other parts of the Bible are still legitimate and has legitimate wisdom in there. Next question. Uh, why do all the religions disagree so much? Fundamentally, it's actually amazing how much the religions all agree with each other. Considering that they were started um, in different continents at different times, by different people, under different situations, um, there's a shocking amount of agreement between Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, and others. That is, if you know how to look and study the texts properly. And then you might wonder, well, Leo, how do you know you're studying the text properly? Well, you need direct experience, direct mystical experience. By having these mystical experiences, by having a personal 
understanding of God, it becomes extremely easy to sort the wheat from the chaff in these various religious texts. And it's also then extremely easy to see the commonalities. A lot of the disagreements can be explained simply because, like I said, different cultures, different times, um, call for different types of explanations. Religions will stress one thing over another thing because their culture needed that. Um, religions will also use different language. They will um, carve up God into different parts because the human mind categorizes things in different ways, and there's various kinds of categorization schemes, not one ultimate one. Um, and because there's so few people that actually have the full awakening experience of God, that usually oftentimes they have more minor awakenings, various other kinds of visions and mystical insights and experiences, but not like the full Monty. And so because of that, most people never reach full non-duality. And so then they end up having partial understanding, not a full integral understanding. And also, of course, these religions, they are not integral. They don't seek to understand each other. They always seek to kind of monopolize the truth for themselves. They tend to favor themselves and their own culture while denying other religions and other cultures. So the attitude of trying to integrate religions, this is a, a rather modern notion, which has really only existed like for the last 50 or 100 years at most. Um, and it's something that I love to do. I love taking that kind of integral holistic approach when studying spirituality, but um, a lot of people don't do that. And so, of course, when you don't do that, then a lot of surface disagreements will seem as though they run all the way down to the bone, but they don't. They're just surface level stuff. Different language, different ways of phrasing things. So you got to learn how to understand these religious texts. In fact, one of the things that um, made me so convinced of the possibility of awakening before I even awoke was I started studying, really studying various religious traditions and spiritual traditions and seeing just how much commonality there is between the things they talk about. And to me, that actually became very convincing, um, corroborating evidence that this was really worthwhile to pursue. Because if all these people across all this time are talking about it in such similar ways, then surely there must be something there and it can't all just be a fantasy and superstition. And that turns out to be exactly correct. There is a reason why billions of people on the planet throughout all of human history across all continents and eras have believed in God. It ain't just a superstition. Now, of course, very few of these people have actually experienced God, but their belief in it and the fact that this belief spreads so easily um, says something more than just mass psychosis or mass hallucination or just groupthink. Um, there's actually something there. And that's something that a lot of atheists don't appreciate. As an atheist, I challenge you to come up with some crazy, fantastical idea and try to get it to spread to billions of people across the entire planet before the age of the internet, before books, before television, before radio. That was not easy to do. So it's not as easy as you think to just spread mind viruses and delusion. Always delusion has to be grounded in some kernel of truth. So usually the delusion isn't just made out of whole cloth, there's a kernel of truth underneath it, which is what um, atheists misunderstand about religion. Next question. But Leo, isn't uh, religion responsible for most of the war and evil throughout history? That's true. Religion is responsible for a lot of so-called evil, what we as humans perceive as evil. Um, and religion has definitely been used by kings and emperors and nations and governments to justify all sorts of wars and atrocities and all that. But then again, you know, technology is also used for a bunch of evil. Capitalism is used for evil. Many wars have been started purely for capitalistic purposes. Um, a lot of people were killed simply with various kinds of technological advances, from nuclear weapons to various kinds of um, 
chemical warfare, gas, and bows and arrows. And so, I mean, you have to you have to separate out um, the fact that people are selfish, and they're egotistical, and they're very tribal, and they're very warlike, uh, whether they have their hands on religion or not. So, just because that is true doesn't mean that uh, God isn't something that you can uh, discover for yourself. Next question. Leo, why use the word God? It's such a loaded word. It's so misunderstood by people. Why not use a word like reality or even invent a new word? Well, it's true that the word God is very much misunderstood by most people. But at the same time, it is the most proper word. When you have this experience, the first words coming to your mind will be, Oh my fucking God. That's actual God. I'm in the presence of actual God. <laughs> that's what you're going to say. So that's why I use that word. Of course, we could always use different words. In a certain sense, it's a stylistic choice. You could call it nothingness. You could call it Buddha mind. You could call it being. You could call it infinity. You could call it some new word that you invent. But really, it's just God. Uh, there's a lot of confusion around it, but understand that no matter which word you use, there's going to be a lot of confusion around it. Because that's how the devilish ego mind works. Is that it always seeks to uh, co-opt the truth and turn it into falsehood. So whatever new you, word you would invent, uh, people would come along and they would find ways to, to delude themselves about it. We almost can't help it. The ignorant mind can't help but being ignorant. And if you call it something very neutral like reality, the problem with that is that, well, people also think they know what reality is. So people have a lot of conceptions about reality which are completely wrong. So if I was just going to call it reality, then it would be very difficult for an ordinary person to distinguish what I'm talking about from their ordinary experience. Because everyone thinks they know what reality is. At least when I say God, then it's like, well, God is something kind of controversial, is something different. Most people don't believe that they've experienced God. Um, and so that's why I use that word. Next question. Uh, why do different religions or different religious people have different experiences or visions of God? For example, a Christian might see Christ, whereas a Hindu might see Vishnu, or a Muslim might see Allah or, or Muhammad or something like this. So people talk about various kinds of mystical visions. And how do these mystical visions relate to God? Because, Leo, you say God is formless, but then how come someone can see a, a vision of Christ? Is that a hallucination or what? what is that? Because reality is one giant mind, this mind uses various kinds of symbols to understand. Understanding is done symbolically. Even scientific understanding, which you might think is literal, is not actually literal. It's still symbolic. It's still metaphoric. So, your mind needs to make sense of the formless in some kind of formed ways in order to talk about it, to think about it, to believe in it, to pray to it, and so forth. So, when a Christian who grew up his whole life uh, with symbols of Christ, pictures of Christ, and Bible stories, and so forth, when he's having the experience of God, it might appear as though, like, the vision of Christ and vice versa for a, for a Hindu with one of his deities, whatever deity he believed in and was growing up with and got attached to. You see, the mind gets attached to various kinds of symbols. And likewise, if you're highly scientific, like if you're a mathematician and you have a mystical experience, you might interpret that in a mathematical sort of language. You might see a formula that you think of it as, which is actually sort of what happened, for example, with Georg Cantor who was the father of modern set theory when he discovered the um, absolute infinite set, right? He called it God. He was a Christian. He framed it in Christian terms. 
that's how it sort of works. So this is not uh, this is not actually an argument against God. It's actually um, it's actually uh, exactly how you sort of expect it to work. Is that your understanding of God is going to be again filtered through your culture and the stuff that you grew up learning. So if you're a scientist, you're going to have a scientific understanding of God. If you're a Christian, it'll be a Christian understanding, a Hindu, some kind of Hindu understanding, and so forth. Now, of course, also understand that most people, when they have an awakening experience, they don't get a full, pure, non-dual God consciousness of the formless Godhead. Very rarely does that happen. Usually, they get more minor mystical visions. And those usually can come in the form of various kinds of avatars and light shining from the clouds or some, some sort of stuff like this. And these can still be valid, but they're just not that like full-on pure like Buddha mind, full awakening that you would get um, if you were, you know, sitting and meditating for thousands of hours very rigorously. Mm, and that, that's, that's all fine. Um, it's just like uh, very few people become totally awake. And that's one of the values of 5-MeO-DMT is that it's a tool that allows you to be totally awake, very clearly, without any kind of visual distortions or hallucinations or visions. It's just like pure, full-on consciousness, which is why it's really good for cutting through all of the nonsense and all of the um, various imagery and symbolism, just going straight for pure consciousness. So... Uh, that's why that happens. Uh, another question. Next question. Leo, aren't you just stealing and rebranding ideas from Advaita Vedanta, Zen, Yoga, and Buddhism, various Eastern religions? Um, no. Actually, I study all spiritual traditions. Of course, in the East, they have some really good high-quality teachings, generally speaking, the Eastern teachings are less corrupt than the Western teachings. They're more strict. They tend to be a little bit more scientific-like, for example, with Buddhism or with Zen or with Advaita Vedanta. Um, but that doesn't mean that the Western teachings are, are bad or that there's not amazing stuff to be found in the Western teachings. So... Um, yeah, I recommend that you study all this stuff. And as far as stealing and rebranding, you have to understand that that no religion and no culture has a monopoly on uh, the idea of God or spirituality. Now, the Hindus like to say that, oh, we are the first ones, you know. Leo, uh, in India, we've been doing yoga and we've known about Brahman for 5,000 years, blah, 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 blah. We were the first. Um Certainly, India has an amazing, rich tradition. It has some great traditions like Advaita Vedanta. Uh, but don't kid yourself to think that you were somehow the first. You weren't the first. Uh, modern Homo sapiens have been dated back to 450,000 years ago. And I would be willing to bet that mankind has known about God and about various spiritual techniques and teachings and insights for at least that long, for 450,000 years, long before there was an India. And it's been known all around the world, in Africa, in Aboriginal Australia, the Eskimos in, in, in North America knew about it, the Native Americans, the South Americans knew about it, um, you know, the Irish and the British knew about it. Um, before even the Romans and the Greeks, the Egyptians knew about it. I mean, so uh, don't don't get too partial about your culture. Yeah, you love your culture. Everybody loves their culture. So what? Let it go. Um, nobody has a monopoly on the truth. These these truths were there from the very beginning of human history, before history was recorded. Um, so. Um, so yeah, I mean, of course, yeah, we're all talking about the same stuff, basically. Um, the Christians, the Buddhists, the Jews. 
uh, are, you know, are we stealing, is one of them stealing from the other? No, it's just like you can access these things independently. And then, of course, there's cross-pollination. We also borrow ideas from each other. We try to find the best ideas from each tradition. Sure, that's, that's totally natural. That's how it should be. Next question. But Leo, Buddhism and Hinduism are actually different. Buddhism doesn't have a god. What are you talking about? Of course Buddhism has a god. The god of Buddhism is Mu, the ox, no self, Buddha mind, the Dharmakaya, Nirvana. These are various ways of talking about God within Buddhism. The mistake that some Buddhists make and some Hindus make is that they think that there's a, there's a substantial difference in enlightenment between the Buddhist no-self and the Hindu self with a capital S, as though these are two different things. Two different enlightenments. They're not two different enlightenments. What there are, there are, there are degrees of awakening. At the earliest stages of awakening, usually what you become conscious of is the truth of no self. That's a powerful uh, insight, but that's not the end of the road. And usually that's not enough to have consciousness of God. To have consciousness of God, you need to go beyond the insight of there not just being a self, but to realize what is the ultimate self? What is the nature of reality itself? What is form? You need to not only be able to realize God is the formless, but also God is the form, and then also to unify the two together and to see that God is both the form and the formless and that there's actually no distinction between the form and the formless. So uh, Buddhism certainly has a God. It's just that in Buddhism, it's not talked about as God in the traditional sense. And so this can give you the impression that Buddhism doesn't believe in a God. Um, well, that's right. Buddhism doesn't really believe in a God per se, but Buddhism has practices that get you to a consciousness of your true nature, which is God. <laughs> Same thing. Nirvana, the Dharmakaya, the Mu, M-U, that is talked about in the Zen riddles. Next question. But Leo, God is not an experience. What are you talking about? Experience. Well, don't get too pedantic on me here. I use the word experience rather loosely because we don't have really any other word for, <laughs> for how to explain one's access to God. Really, the proper word would be something more akin to being or direct consciousness. But oftentimes, I just use the word experience instead because most people don't have a reference point for what being or direct consciousness is, but they understand what experience is. So if you expand your notion of experience to also include direct consciousness um, or being, then, um, then what I'm saying makes sense. Also understand that when you're, when you're coming into contact with the Godhead, the pure formless God, which is free of any sensation or any quote-unquote experience. There's kind of like no experience there. It's just like nothingness, the void. Um, you can have that, and that's good, but you also need to understand that you got to bring that back down to earth and integrate it with the experience that you're having here. You need to become conscious that this experience that's happening right now, all the colors, sounds, feelings, and all this, that this is actually identical to that pure, empty void which you might experience in some um, deep meditative trance. See? So the fact is that this experience right this very moment is God. You just need to become conscious that that's what it is. That will recontextualize the experience that you're having here to the point that you're not even going to think of it as an experience anymore. Really what's happening here is not an experience. We conventionally call it an experience, but what's happening here is just absolute truth. Absolute truth is happening at all times. There's nothing but absolute truth. We just confuse it in various ways. Next question. Leo, what is the point of cross-referencing sources like you say you do when God is a direct experience? So why do you need these other sources? Well, precisely because you can trick yourself. 
precisely because there's the danger of becoming a Zen devil. See my episode, Becoming a Zen Devil, which talks about the danger of pursuing Zen practice without reading the scriptures, without grounding yourself in some theoretical foundation. That turns out to be important. And because it is possible to have half-assed experiences, it is possible to have an experience but not to fully understand it, or to misinterpret it, or to have some ego backlash, and then to use it in a narcissistic manner to, to, to do whatever for your survival agenda. Um, you know, because all of that is possible, uh, it's important to have high-quality sources to double-check yourself. Definitely don't just take your mystical experiences at face value. Validate them against what the best scriptures and teachings of ancient times and modern times uh, say. So that you're in accordance with that. Find some high-quality sources, books, teachers, videos, YouTube channels, audiobooks, whatever. Uh, find some great yogis, some great masters, and then cross-reference your experiences with that. Double check the things that I'm telling you against other sources. Then you won't be so skeptical and you won't be so stubbornly uh, closed minded about it. You see, the more sources you, you cross reference, the more convinced you're going to become that this is something that's worthwhile for you to pursue and that it's not just um, new age mumbo jumbo and superstition. Next question Why not just kill yourself and become God right now? If you say that death is God, then why didn't you kill yourself, Leo? Um, well, yeah, it's true that when you die, you will become God. Um, but, uh, but also, you're, you're going to lose this life. And there's a reason why God incarnated itself into this life in the first place. You're here to experience this life. You see? So, uh, I mean, you could cut it short if you want, but also, I mean, understand that if you kill yourself, you're not going anywhere but exactly here. There's nowhere to go. You're going to end up right back here. God is constantly reincarnating itself. So it'll just incarnate itself into some other form. Maybe you'll become a, a crow sitting on, on a building, squawking away. Or maybe you'll become an alligator or something else. You know, so um, while you're in this incarnation, make the most of it, I say. That's sort of my theory. Um, do the work to become enlightened. And the reason you want to become enlightened sooner rather than later is because you want to experience the fullness of life. You want to be able to experience the magnificence of this life, of this particular incarnation that you have. And how are you going to do that if you're preoccupied with delusions? And if you're so self-involved and narcissistic and you're suffering and you're in pain all the time and you hate the world and you're depressed and you're anxious and you're miserable, how are you going to really fulfill your mission as God of experiencing this incarnation? You won't. So if you become enlightened now rather than later, you know, then you'll get to experience a long, rich life of woke living. <laughs> and woke living is much better than um, uh, living as a zombie, addicted and suffering and miserable and confused about life. You don't want to wait till your last breath to realize God. In a sense, that's very sad because if you realize God in the last five minutes of your life on your deathbed, well, all you're going to realize is how much of your life you could have lived being conscious of the miracle that is here rather than being so frustrated and, and bitter all the time, hating on other people, doing violence to other people, fighting with other people, manipulating other people. Right? So uh, the point is to live a conscious life as soon as you can, <laughs> ideally, unless you want to suffer. And you know what? Sometimes God just wants to suffer. And so maybe in this particular incarnation, uh, the purpose of your birth was that you as God are going to live through um, the worst possible form of egotism 
and just cause yourself all sorts of hell and suffering and misery and not wake. And hey, you know, that's the case for 99% of people. But it doesn't have to be that way for you. You have some say in the matter. You can change that by doing spiritual practices. So I would say don't wait until the end. Become enlightened now and, um, and make the most of your life. It's kind of like a video game. You turn on the video game and now you get to play and enjoy it. So, of course, you could always turn off the video game if you don't want to play. Um, but the only thing to do in the universe is to play these games. There's nothing but games to play. So you might as well kind of like try to make the, the, the most of it and enjoy it as much as you can. Next question. Leo, how can ego exist in the presence of God if God is all-knowing? Well, it's precisely because God is all-powerful that God is actually able to set up a situation where it forgets itself and then has to awaken to itself. See? Because that pure formless Godhead, it doesn't really have the ability to awaken to itself because it already is itself and it doesn't really have any kind of um, mind or form that can kind of like realize what it is. It's too empty for that. All it does is it just sits there and it just bees. But you as a human, you can awaken precisely because you do have a mind and your mind is filled with all sorts of concepts and delusions and false ideas about the world and you don't know everything. Um, and so because of this, you can precisely awaken to, um, to that formlessness. And then you can also kind of like bring it back into your earthly life. And then you can, you can then see how that formlessness is manifest in all of the various forms that exist and you can sort of see how God manifests itself as a lamp, as a dog, as a tree, as a car, as a galaxy, as the night sky, as murder, as war, as rape, and all these other things. And you can marvel at that. But see, the Godhead itself can't really do that because it's it's just pure potential and pure uh, pure emptiness. So in a sense, the Godhead incarnates itself into form so that I could see the full ramifications of what it is. And so really what God is up to here is God is becoming conscious of itself. What does it mean to be God? It doesn't just mean to be a formless singularity. It also simultaneously means all of the form and structure that you've experienced in your life. It means that puppy that's uh, being walked down the street in the morning. It means the hot cup of coffee that you spill on yourself when you're rushing to work. It means getting a flat tire and then having to deal with that in the rain. It means getting some money stolen from you by a business partner and making you feel bad about your business. It means war and famine and political chaos and corruption. It means all of this. But see, for God to, to really understand what it is, what it means to be God, it has to live through it. It can't be a theoretical exercise. God has to actually incarnate and live through itself to know itself. And so that's what's going on here. In your life, it's just one little infinitesimal fragment of the entirety of God that God must live through to understand what it means to be God. So what it means to be God is what it means to live through your life, my life, and every life that has ever lived as a human being on this planet since the beginning of humans. But not just that, also every ant, every dragonfly, every butterfly, every monkey, every bird that has ever lived on this entire planet and will ever live. So God needs to incarnate as all of that to experience what Earth really is. You can only understand Earth by living through it, through the perspective and eyes, so to speak, of all the different creatures that live on Earth. But of course, it's just Earth. I read just yesterday that the latest estimate by scientists is that there are like a hundred billion stars 
in the Milky Way galaxy. Just the Milky Way galaxy. And now the estimate for how many galaxies are in this universe is one trillion galaxies. So just think about how many Earths are out there in all these trillion galaxies in this one universe out of potentially many other universes, you know, comprising a multiverse, um, and how many creatures God is simultaneously living through. But of course, not just this slice of time, but throughout all of time, throughout infinite time. Uh, so just, you know, it's, it's staggering. It's staggering to, to consider that. So God has to go through all of that in order to realize, oh, so that's what it means to be God. All right. In the same way that, you know, when, when you were born, do you remember being amazed by your own body? And just like looking at your body when you were born, because you, you didn't know yourself as a body, even. You had to like actually look at your hand. And it, at first it was kind of amazing. Like, why do I have five fingers? Why not six? And you know, what, what can my fingers do? Like when you were a baby, you didn't even know what your fingers were capable of. You had to actually like learn that your fingers can bend forwards, but not backwards. Or if you push your finger too much to, to one side, it's going to cause pain. You have to learn that by actually going through it. You couldn't learn that by being told about it. You had to live through it. And you had to actually like feel your body. You had to actually like, I remember when I was little, I would have to like open my mouth in front of a mirror and like look inside and see teeth. Because I didn't know what teeth looked like. Or why were there even teeth? And then, and then like new teeth start growing. Uh, when you're in, in elementary school, you know, you get your second set of teeth. And then, and then the, the baby teeth fall out. And it's all so weird. Like, you don't know what's happening. And then, like, when you're an adolescent, your body is changing hormones and all this. And then so, you, you know, your facial hair is coming in. And so, like, you're feeling it. You're looking at it. You're like, what is this shit? <laughs> what, is, what is going on here? I don't even know myself. Well, that's exactly what's happening at large with God. See, God doesn't really know itself until it lives through itself. Next question. What is the point of talking about God? The point of talking about God is to make you aware that this is a possibility that you can realize for yourself and that this is an amazing possibility. It's not just like talking about some little thing like, oh yeah, you could start a, a cookie baking business. That's a possibility. But for most people, you know, a cookie baking business isn't their thing. So talking about it isn't that relevant. But when we're talking about God, this is relevant to absolutely everybody because everybody is God. It's the one common denominator. Um, and not only that, but it's so relevant because it completely transforms your life and it makes you, well, it, it frees you of all the suffering and delusion and it opens your life to the possibility of, of true, genuine joy and health and well-being. Uh, so the point of talking about God is to make you aware of that, because most people aren't aware of that, and to uh, point you to techniques for achieving that, because it's not enough to be aware of the possibility, you've got to actualize the possibility, and also to point out all the trickeries and traps that exist along the way that almost everybody inevitably falls into. And there's hundreds of different traps. So there's actually quite a lot to talk about. Even though while we're doing all this talking, we're never actually going to get to God through our words and through our talking. The talking is still extremely valuable. So don't dismiss the talking. Don't dismiss the teachings. Sometimes the teaching can seem repetitive. It can seem like, oh, this is stuff I already know. Well, to really know it, you got to live it. So sometimes you got to go through the repetition in order to really get it, to motivate yourself, to inspire you. That's a lot of what spiritual teachings are about, to inspire you. So it doesn't matter if you've heard this stuff before. The question is, are you living it? And if not, then maybe you could stand hearing it another time until you really get it, until it hits you and you actually start to do the practices. And then you can let go of the teachings and the talking once you're fully awake. But for most people, we're talking about decades before they become fully awake and many mistakes that they'll make and many areas in which they'll get stuck before they become fully awake. 
And even if you are fully awake, there's still more to talk about because there's development as well. There's not just God to realize, there's also emotional mastery and various other components. And how do you how do you apply your realization of God in the everyday world? That's sort of called a post-satori practice. Next question. Will science ever be able to understand God? Depends on how you define science. The way science is defined today, no. Because science today is conceptual and symbolic. And by definition, God is not a symbol. God is being. So, you can't get there with uh, symbols. You can't get there with equations. But of course, science will evolve and mature in the future. And it will open itself up more and more to mysticism and to non-symbolic uh, methods of investigation. First-person experiences will be admitted as legitimate and not just anecdotal. Um, psychedelics will become a legitimate scientific tool. Uh, scientists will begin using psychedelics to do better research on themselves, um, not just in cl clinical trials on, on guinea pigs and stuff. Um, and so uh, I anticipate that within, within the next couple hundred years, science will recognize God. Of course, it'll be sort of a different version of God. It won't be the Christian God. It'll be sort of a scientific version of God. So maybe science will acknowledge something like absolute infinity or nothingness. That will be easier for most scientists to swallow. Um, but it'll only do that by really transforming itself. So the old science will die and the new science will basically incorporate mysticism into it. Because you know what? We already have a science of God. We've had a science of God for over 5,000 years. And you know what it's called? It's called mysticism. Mysticism is the direct empirical pursuit of God and the study of God through meditation, contemplation, yoga, and other methods. So we have a rich science of God. The problem is that it's separated from uh, modern academic materialist science. And so these will need to be bridged. And it's already beginning. The bridge is already being built by, uh, by visionaries and pioneers. So it's, it's already started to happen. And so in the future, more and more scientists will have these mystical experiences for themselves. And when that starts to happen, that's when science will really explode. Because once you become a mystic and you also combine that with science, well, then you can make some amazing breakthroughs because your mind is so much more integrated and you can have so much, such powerful insights that you couldn't have before. But also understand that at that point, um, science will sort of become mysticism to a certain degree. So you see, the line between science and religion and science and mysticism, that's not a hard line that exists in the world. That's a line that the human mind is drawing. That's a culturally drawn line. And so culture will have to change for that line to change. We'll change our definitions of mysticism and science in such a way that they will be more uh, closely merged together. Another question is, isn't it possible, Leo, that science will answer all questions given enough time and that we really don't need mysticism? We just need to give science more time? Uh, the answer is no. Not unless you radically redefine what science is. If you redefine science to include mysticism, then yes, the answer is yes. Um, but modern science, no. It's going to have to shed its materialistic dogmas and it's going to have to recognize limits. Science has serious limits. Science only works through language, through concepts, through the mind. And yet, there are aspects of reality which are beyond the mind. So how is science going to deal with that? At some point, science is going to have to relent and acknowledge that there are aspects of reality which are true, but which are not provable in the traditional materialistic sense, and which are beyond the mind, and which needs to be accessed through 
methods that are not equations or charts or graphs or uh, particle colliders or rulers or photographs, but something else. Next question, is it possible that science and spirituality work together in the future? Yes, that's just what I was describing. In fact, I see personally um, my greatest contribution, I think, to mankind will be to help to integrate science and spirituality. That's basically what I'm doing here. <laughs> I'm laying the epistemic foundation for the reform of science. That's really what I'm doing. Um, that's where most of my intellectual efforts go. It's not into creating videos that help you to awaken per se, although I enjoy doing that. It's, it's mostly to reform the epistemology of science because um, I see very important reforms that need to be made within the foundations of, of Western science, which will then advanced, advance both science and it'll advance spirituality as well. So uh, it's already happening. I'm working on that right now. I'm working on, on books and things that I'm writing in order to do this. I'm working on videos in order to do this, but it won't just be me. Many people will be doing this over the next 100 or 200 years, and it will be a very important and revolutionary development within Western civilization and within the history of science. It'll be a, uh, it'll be a, a new scientific revolution when that is complete. But there will also be a lot of resistance and it won't happen within our lifetimes. Next question. If God is all alone, does God feel lonely? Does God have imperfections like loneliness, or is God completely satisfied and sufficient in itself? So here again, we got to distinguish between the Godhead, the formless Godhead, and God incarnated as various things. So the formless Godhead is completely devoid of qualities, so it's not lonely. Even though it is all alone, it's not lonely. It doesn't feel anything, and loneliness is a sort of feeling. But God, in his incarnated form as a human being, or maybe as, a, as an animal, um, in that way, God can feel lonely. And that's precisely why, to keep you, you from feeling alone, you have created the, the notion of other people and other beings, which gives you company. <laughs> and when you realize that all these other beings are really just um, figments of your imagination, your own projections, well, at that moment, you will start to feel very alone. But that's still your ego reacting. Once you accept that and you get past it, you will realize that actually being all alone as God is, uh, is great. <laughs> There's no one to bother you <laughs> except yourself. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, you can always fall back into the delusion that there are other people and that can, uh, that can relieve you of your loneliness. But generally speaking, when you're fully, fully conscious and awake, uh, you're not going to feel lonely, even though you will be alone because you're the only thing that there is and can ever be. Uh, next question. Why are some people very curious about God while others are not? It's a good question. I've been thinking about this one for a while, and uh, I don't have uh, a clear answer, so I'm going to speculate a bit here. This is my best attempt so far. I think that people are born with different brain types, different genetics, and also there's a strong environmental factor to how you're raised, where you go to school and so forth. And so I think that certain people have a brain type which is more metaphysically oriented like myself. And we have been curious about metaphysical questions since we were kids throughout our whole life. And we just can't turn it off. We're always asking, where is reality coming from? Why is it here? What's it doing here? What is the point of life? And, and so forth. Where did consciousness come from? Right? We're very naturally curious about very fundamental issues. But most people aren't. Most people are just interested in uh, survival taking care of their basic needs, having a family, business, work, sex, entertainment, and so forth. Uh, I mean, I'm interested in those things too, so don't get me wrong. Um, I enjoy all those things. But, um, but fundamentally, I'm very metaphysically curious. And you probably are too if you're following Actualized.org in a lot of depth. 
Um, but most people you meet won't be that way. And that's probably because a combination that they don't have the right brain type, but also they probably weren't raised in such a manner where they were exposed to these things. You know, if we had a really good education system, we would expose children to the joys of epistemic and metaphysical inquiry and spirituality very early on. And then I think many more of them would be uh, curious about questions of God and spirituality and so forth. Um, also, I think that you have to understand that some people are just born spiritually gifted, whether it's genetic or I don't know what it is, but it just seems to be that way. And, um, and I think, and this is just a theory of mine, uh, but it's an interesting theory that ancient humans, if we're talking about 400,000 years ago or even 10,000 years ago, ancient humans were much more spiritually interested and curious than modern humans. But as modern civilization arose about 10,000 years ago during ancient Egypt um, and then through modern times, we had an enormous amount of war, genocide, torture, and just slavery, brutality of, of every kind. And so because the competitive survival pressures became so large on all human populations as the world got overpopulated, what happened was that I'm, I'm willing to bet that a lot of very spiritual people were just killed off because that's how survival works. When you're not overly obsessed with your survival, but everyone else around you is, that gives them a certain competitive advantage. So in a certain sense, people today are very focused on their survival and they're very egotistical and materialistic. And that is because they needed to be that way in order to survive all of the wars and brutality that mm, happened during the last 10,000 years of human civilization. That was the cost of building modern civilization. But also that comes at a, at, at a great, uh, well, at a great cost because, because now we're starting to see the limits of that. You know, we're starting to overpopulate the whole planet and we might even um, kill ourselves off as a species if we continue with our materialism unabated. So, um, I can easily see how thousands of years ago, deeply spiritually attuned people, people who were literally genetically predisposed to being very mystical and to have easy access to God and various other kinds of mystical insights and paranormal abilities, that these people were just killed off because they weren't practical to civilization and because they were a thorn in the side of most kings and dictators and tyrants who wanted to rule the world. And so I think millions of people uh, who were naturally spiritually gifted were just killed off to the point where the most ruthless and egotistical ones survived. Um, and also remember, <laughs> the reason why few people are, are so curious about God is because curiosity killed the cat. And curiosity is a dangerous thing. You're playing with your whole sense of reality and life here when we're talking about curiosity. It's not just curiosity as a like, oh yeah, I'm just curious about watching some YouTube video about God. No, it's like if you follow this rabbit hole all the way to its conclusion, it's going to kill you <laughs> and you don't want that. So, so of course, most people aren't that curious. Most people's curiosity is just skin deep. Next question. By what mechanism does God create things? This is so challenging to explain to a materialist because you're used to having mechanisms for everything and science, science's whole job is to break reality down into chains of cause and effect and mechanisms that you can manipulate to make technology. And so we think that, the, well, then God must also do that. The universe must somehow like have mechanical rules or mathematical equations, or it must be a computer simulation shuffling neuro, uh, electrons back and forth via circuits or something like that in order to actually create the universe. Uh, but the, actually, the answer is much more simple than that. Um, 
The mechanism of God is direct. There is no mechanism. What you see is the mechanism. So conventionally, this present experience that we're having together right now, you would think that this experience right here is caused by some neurons, some neurotransmitters in the mind or in the brain, rather, uh, biological phenomena, or even molecules bouncing around, quantum mechanic effects, or whatever you believe. Physical laws, equations. None of that is actually true. The entire universe is spontaneously, amechanically existing. It's just being. It has no mechanism. The mechanism only appears to you. Cause and effect chains only appear to you when you are looking through it, using the human mind and trying to make sense of little pieces of it. Then you can mechanically break it apart and it seems as though there's mechanisms and causes and effects. Actually, there is no mechanism. There's no mathematical equations behind the scenes. There's absolutely nothing. What you see is exactly the mechanism. Here it is. The problem is, you're not conscious of it. The problem is, if you became conscious of it, you would see and realize that it's literally one solid miracle. And that's precisely what you're resisting as a materialist. That's something you're going to have to experience a rude awakening into to realize. You might wonder, well, Leo, how is it possible that a thing can appear spontaneously amechanically, as if by magic. But how is anything possible? How is anything possible? You see, as a scientist and materialist, you need to have some kind of ultimate elementary particle that is grounding your entire sense of reality. So quarks, strings, atoms, whatever it is. So you might ask a scientist, how can there be quarks? What is the mechanism of there being quarks? And the answer will be, we can't say. We can only get to the bottom level, and as we get to the most bottom level, we can't say any more about it than that. Sometimes Some, some scientists will say, well, it's equations. But then you can always ask, but, but what's the mechanism for the generation of the equations? And by what mechanism do the, gener by, do the equations actually run the universe? To which the answer will be, we can't say. So, in a sense, what you're doing with science is you're pushing the explanation down, 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 down to the lowest level. And then you're excusing it away and you're saying, well, maybe we'll figure it out in the next hundred years but you're never figuring it out because it's infinite. You're, you're going to be pushing that explanation forever. What you need to realize is that the what you can do is you can treat the entire universe as one elemental molecule. So instead of saying that quarks just are elemental and fundamental and they just exist and they just are, or equations just are, imagine if you just said this present moment just is and there's no explanation for it and you will never explain it. Not in a million years, because there is no explanation, because the explanation is itself. The explanation is being. You see, it's, it's so direct you can't point to it, is the problem. It's so direct you can't explain it. It's so direct you can't know it. But you can become conscious of the fact that um, it is just pure magical manifestation from nothingness. And that's an amazing thing to realize. Next question, where did God come from? God has always existed. God is eternal. So imagine a thing that has existed forever and will exist forever. That's God. God also created itself. Now you might wonder, Leo, if God is eternal, then how come you say it created itself? Isn't that a contradiction? It's like either it was eternal or it was created, but it can't be both. Actually, it's both. 
depending on how you understand God. So that formless Godhead is eternal. But form, you might say, is sort of created. And so in this sense, I say God created itself. I say that you created yourself in the sense that you like created your own body, created your own mind, created this particular moment. But at the same time, this moment and this body and this mind has also existed eternally. So in a, it's a weird, it's a very weird paradoxical thing. It makes no sense to explain it uh, kind of the way I'm doing now, but you, just like you can become conscious that it's both eternal and that you created yourself. Both are true. Um, you might also wonder, why did God create itself? Um, and the answer is that, well, first of all, it's eternal, so it's always been. But also, it created itself, like I said earlier, because it wants to experience itself. Creation and being are really the same thing. So to say that God created itself is just to say that God is is being. And so for God to be, it needs to be in all the ways that it is, in all the ways that it can be. You know, sort of that saying, be the best that you can be, make the most of yourself. Well, that's what God is doing. God is following that motto. God is making the most of itself. God is creating itself every second. So don't think of it as like, God created itself some time, a long time ago, before the universe happened. God created itself. No, 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 no. God is constantly creating itself. Every word coming out of my mouth is a creation of God, which is happening every second. It's happening as though for the first time, right now, and right now, and right now, and right now, and every moment forever. It's a never-ending process of self-creation and being. Next question. Can God be an alien or an AI? And the answer is no, it can't. Because an alien or an AI is a specific limited thing. So if you have an AI, you have something that's not an AI, which is possible. If you have an alien, you have something that's not an alien, which is possible. But God is the totality of everything. It's the meta thing. God includes all the different AIs, all the different aliens, all the different humans, and everything else in between. So it, it can't. You can definitively know that AI that a God is not AI or an alien. Which is not to say you can't have AIs or aliens. You could probably have both. I don't know. I don't know if there's alien out, out, aliens out there. But if there are, they certainly aren't uh, the end-all be-all. They aren't the Godhead. But also, they are the Godhead too, because God is incarnating through the alien, through the AI, or whatever else. You're going to find out there. Next question, could God have evolved? To which the answer is that um, God is eternal. So in that sense, no. But at the same time, God is constantly evolving. So creation and evolution are one in the same process. Evolution is happening right now. Every thought you're having, every word you're saying... It's all evolution. It's all happening. Evolution is not limited to biological creatures or to, to sexuality. Evolution is the movement of the entire universe as a whole. And so God is, in a sense, evolving. Next question, how do you reconcile God with scientific traditional Darwinian evolution? Because these can seem like they're at odds. They're actually not at odds. They're the same thing. Design and evolution are actually the same thing. When a human being sits down to design a skyscraper or a clock, it might seem like what he's doing is not evolution. Actually, it is. That is evolution, too. Um, evolution definitely occurs in the sense that animals change their forms and they adapt to their environments and all of that. And it happens through various genetics and all that. But you have to understand that there's a larger context for scientific Darwinian evolution. All of that is happening within the larger context of the mind of God. 
And all of that ha is happening with intelligence and sentience and by design, so to speak. It's not happening through randomness or chaos and just fluke luck that some creature evolves with, with wings or with eyes or with feathers or whatever. Next question. Leo, if I created myself as God, then why did I create this shitty life? Well, uh, that's a good question. <laughs> you do have the option to change your life at any time. So feel free to exercise that option. Feel free to exercise the option of spiritual development to grow yourself and to awaken. And then you won't feel like your life is shitty anymore. Uh, but really, I mean, you have to understand that culture and society, it's all evolving. Uh, the world is still in the dark ages, basically. And so God is trying to bootstrap itself. It's a civilization, society, it's all bootstrapping itself and evolving forward. So, of course, uh, you think your life is bad now. Imagine how your life might have been back in the, in the Roman days where 40% of the Roman population were slaves. So, I mean, life can get very hellish. Um, and that's just part of the brutality of life. See, the thing that's really difficult for people to understand is that God is really, truly in love with all of creation to such a radical degree that it's difficult for most human beings to fathom that such a love is actually love. Try to imagine being in love with with the most shitty situations that you as a human can imagine, and yet God is in love with those. It's living through all of those. It doesn't judge anything. So, you know, uh, God is going to live through every possible scenario that a human being has ever lived through. In fact, you, as God, will live through every possible scenario that any human being will ever live through. So you will know what it's like to feel depression and death and cancer and disability and heartbreak and cheating and lying and thieving and all this sort of stuff. So really, that's why the Buddha said that life is suffering. And the only solution to that is to awaken. Awakening is what allows you to deal with any kind of shitty life, so to speak. That's what allows you to deal with it gracefully. And uh, really, uh, most people in life, they're only joyful and happy to the extent that life is going their way. They don't realize just how fragile their happiness is. So easy to lose your happiness in life because it's so conditional, which is why you should strive to awaken. But, you know, fear not. If you have a shitty life, you can change it too. That's what all this content is here for, all these self-help techniques and books. You can educate yourself and you can improve your life enormously. And most of all, by awakening. Next question. Is it possible to become conscious of God at all times in everyday life and not just as some peak experience or some 5-MeO trip or only in some meditative state? And the answer is yes, it is. And this is something called Sahaja Samadhi. Sahaja Samadhi is kind of considered like the ultimate state of Samadhi. It's Nirvikalpa Samadhi taken to a permanent degree. So you're constantly permanently awake. It's like being in a high meditative state all the time, 24-7, whether you're uh, going through your day, doing your chores, cooking, eating, doing whatever, and even sleeping. So that's really like what uh, the, the ultimate attainment would be with this work is for you to attain Sahaja Samadhi. But don't expect to attain that easily with one awakening. Most of your first awakenings will just be peak experiences, which will fade. Which brings us to the next question. Well, Leo, how come people realize God, but then fall back into duality? They awaken and then they go back to sleep. Why don't these mystical experiences stick? This is a really good question. I still haven't totally answered it for myself. I think there's a lot of factors involved. But I think um, my theory about it so far is that 
what happens is that because the absolute truth is such a huge thing that you're rarely going to get it in one go. You're going to have to glimpse it piece by piece by piece and to assemble it. Um, and not only that, but also you're going to have to deconstruct a lot of your old ways of living life and understanding reality. And that is just, it's difficult to do that. It's difficult to deconstruct the entire illusion of life in one single moment. That's going to take some real serious work before that happens. And so I think that for these experiences, for these peak experiences to really stick, so to speak, what needs to happen is that you got to grasp them at the very deep level. You have to like fully deconstruct the illusion that was there and infuse consciousness into it such that you can never get tricked by that illusion again. Usually what happens, you get some mystical insight. You're not even sure what it is you saw exactly. You just know it was amazing and, and mystical and, and uh, awesome and life transforming, but you can't quite put your finger on it yet. And usually it escapes you. And then you're kind of like, falling back into duality and your old habits. And maybe you even have some ego backlash that even um, kind of feels like it regresses you in your development. Um, that's totally normal. And so what needs to happen is a sort of deconstructive process. That's why it can be helpful to actually sit down with a journal and start deconstructing your whole life, deconstructing your beliefs so that you can really see through the illusion and you don't buy into it again. See, the illusion is so powerful that even when you break out of it, you're very tempted to fall back in. It's almost hypnotic in how it sucks you back in. And of course, all the temptations of sex and food and money and family and business and career and politics and whatever ideologies you've had, <clears throat> whatever religions you subscribe to, that even if you escape them for a little while, it's just so seductive that it sucks you right back in. And that's going to take a lot of work for you to overcome that. Next question. Why does it have to be so hard to realize God? Because of the survival mechanism that is driving and dominating your entire life. What people do not understand is the significance of the survival drive, which is responsible for everything in your life, thoroughly dominates your entire life. God is the undoing of this survival drive. God is really the opposite of life. God is death from the ego's point of view. It is the surrendering of this survival drive. How do you surrender it? when you've spent literally your entire life addicted to it. It is the thing that is responsible for you sitting here and being able to listen to me. It is the thing that's responsible for you putting food in your stomach, for breathing, for getting water, and those are just the basics. What about your social survival strategies? All of the ideologies you have, they're all tied in with survival. Everything you believe, your family, everything you love, it's all survival. And not only that, but there's millions of years of evolution within your genetics, which is running you. Because your ancestors, those of them that didn't have a strong survival drive, well, they were killed off long ago. And maybe some of them were very spiritual, but nevertheless, they were killed off. You see, there's no problem dying. There's no problem with God getting killed. Uh, but uh, it won't exist then in a formed, incarnated way. It'll be formless. So as formlessness, it doesn't need to go through survival. But once you're in the formed realm, here, what we call physical reality, then you need to pay very close attention to your survival. And so it's hard to realize God. It's hard to awaken. It's hard to make these mystical insights stick because you have decades of habits that you need to undo. And the mind and the brain is slow to change itself. Neurons have to rewire themselves and so forth in order for you 
to be able to change your behaviors and your habits. Now, of course, don't make that a limiting belief. In a certain sense, God could also be easy to realize. In a certain sense, all you have to do to realize God is lock yourself in a room for 30 days and sit there and do nothing. And by the end of those 30 days, <laughs> you will be conscious of God or something close to it if you literally do nothing for 30 days straight, including not fantasizing and thinking for 30 days straight. So, I mean, how hard is that? You're doing nothing, literally nothing. But at the same time, this is the most hard thing you could possibly do in your life, is to just sit for 30 days straight and do nothing uh, and not even think, not even fantasize. So it's both hard and it's easy, depending on, on you. A lot of it, of course, depends on how serious you are. Um, it becomes very hard to realize God when you're not fully committed to it and you're wishy-washy and you're pursuing all these other things and you're distracted and you're trying to raise your family and run your career and do all this sort of stuff. Um, yeah, then it's, it's quite challenging to realize God. But if you're super laser focused, you know, the Buddha, when he sat down, he supposedly did it in under a month. Of course, he had years of training before that, but still, um, when you're really serious, you can do it in under a month. Next question. Can I realize God while running a family or a career? The answer is absolutely. I have books in my book list by enlightened people who became enlightened while they were also in relationships, while they had children or family, while they were going to medical school or being a doctor. So it's been done before and you can do it. The only thing I would recommend is don't try to do it all at once. Don't try to start your family at the same time as you're starting your career, at the same time as you're starting your um, serious pursuit of enlightenment. You want to space those out. So maybe spend five years raising your kid until she's at a certain level where she's off at school. Okay, good. Now you can spend five years building your business or your career until it's stabilized. Good. And then you spend five years by yourself pursuing serious spiritual research and practice. So you could definitely do it that way. And in fact, you know, like in India, they have entire spiritual schools that are devoted to helping what are called householders to pursue a spiritual path. Because most people are not going to become monks and renunciants and ascetics. So most people are running a family in India. You know, they have big families. They need careers to maintain those families and so forth. Um, but various schools of yoga teach powerful yogic techniques that you can practice while you're running a family and your career. And then in 5, 10, 20 years, all those results stack up and you awaken. For example, the uh, one of the founders of Kriya Yoga he he was a householder. He had a family that he ran. And yet he practiced Kriya Yoga and became a guru. Became very awake. Next question. Leo, how come God can be realized through visualization? After all, you say that, that God is, is beyond the mind and that the, the mind is the chief obstacle to God. And so shouldn't visualization be an obstacle to realizing God? Well, this is very interesting. You'd think so, but this is kind of a counterintuitive point. Remember also, though, that the key to realizing God, one of the keys, is concentration. So the way that these visualization methods of realizing God work, and these come from, for example, um, Tantra Yoga and certain um, Tibetan Buddhist traditions, what you can do is you can actually visualize with enormous concentration some kind of deity that you believe in. Whether it's Christ or Krishna or, or, or something else. And you visualize it with such intensity that because the mind is a giant, uh, or the universe is a giant mind, and because what you imagine tends to become your reality, you can literally sort of materialize a vision of your deity. And then what usually happens is then though 
you merge into it. So this is where the samadhi happens, is you actually merge into the deity, and so your vision of the deity and your sense of self, they collapse and merge together, and that's where you have your non-dual unitive mystical experience, and that can be how you realize God. Now, of course, there can be some limitations with this, because you can get too attached to the form of this deity that you're visualizing. So like we talked about earlier, if you're going to be visualizing Christ, um, the problem with that is that, yes, you might realize some facet of God, but are you going to really fully get that full, non-dual, um, formless realization of the Godhead? Or are you going to get attached to this image of Christ of yours? So you do have to be careful, because otherwise you might get too partial a view of what God is or of what awakening is, because the deepest awakening is not going to have any form to it. It's not going to be an image of Shiva or Krishna or Christ or anything else or Buddha. It's just going to be pure, uh, formless void. So you want to make sure you break through to that. Um, but there are a lot of visualization techniques within Tantra Yoga and Tibetan Buddhism. Do I recommend them? Probably not. I think it's a little too esoteric and um, too specific, I would recommend something more like self-inquiry or Kriya Yoga or just regular old meditation. Next question, am I too young to pursue God? Some of you are in your teenage years and you might be asking yourself that. Look, I was asking questions about God basically back when I was 14 years old. Now, I was an atheist back then, so I didn't really believe in God or the possibility of God, but I was asking questions about what is the universe and where did it come from and how come reality works this way? And uh, I was asking epistemic questions and metaphysical questions, which basically were questions about the nature of God. I just didn't call it God at that point. I didn't realize that this is what spirituality was. I called it philosophy. And so I became a philosopher around that time. So uh, I don't really think there is such a thing as too young. Um, the, another similar question is, um, is it possible to awaken as a teen or in your early 20s? Certainly you can. I know enlightened masters who became enlightened in their early 20s. So you can definitely do it. And the sooner you become awake, the better. The only uh, thing I'll, I'll say about that as a caveat, though, is that you also want to make sure as a teen and someone in your early 20s, like many of you are, that you're also taking care of solving your survival. In your teens and early 20s, you need to spend a lot of energy figuring out how to educate yourself properly, learning how the world works, learning how social relationships work, learning how sexuality works, getting your diet and health in order so that you don't... Um, destroy your health when you're older, uh, figuring out how to make a living, how to be financially independent off by yourself so you're not leeching off your parents, uh, finding your career, getting yourself a sense of direction in your life, a sense of life purpose. So all this is very important for you, practically speaking, as a teen. So be working on that because if, if you only pursue awakening, you're going to be very deficient in these other categories and that might create problems for you down the road. So as a teen and in your early 20s, you've got a lot of work to do to figure out how to live life. Next question. Can God be experienced at any stage of the spiral? Can God be experienced at the pre-rational and the rational stages of cognitive development? Or must one be at the uh, trans-rational level? The answer is that yes, God can be experienced at any stage of the spiral. You don't have to be stage turquoise or even yellow. You don't have to uh, be transrational either. But remember that how you experience it will be strongly um, affected by your level of cognitive development and where you are on the spiral. So if you're a stage blue person and you have an experience of God, you're going to have a very limited, partial, ethnocentric 
version of God, a very moralistic version of God, one that accords with your religion. And if you're a stage orange person, you're going to have a very scientific, materialistic version of God. Um, and uh, this, this will create problems for you. So you definitely want to also work on raising your level of cognitive development to get to tier two, at least yellow, so that you have a, a, a more holistic uh, understanding of, of God and spirituality once you do experience it. And also, the higher you are in your spiral level of development, the easier it will be for you to have mystical experiences and to interpret them properly. Because most, for example, stage blue people are so wrapped up in their dogmas about God and their beliefs and their morality and their religion that they won't be even open to, for example, reading some of the advanced spiritual books on my book list that I recommend or doing some of the practices that I recommend because they're going to be so caught up in their stage blue perspective on the world. Same thing with stage orange people. So it's very important that you move into tier two because really people who are tier one, um, they are so preoccupied with their survival needs that they don't really ask very good metaphysical questions. And it's difficult for them to spend a lot of time thinking about that stuff or to pursue that. So climb as high as you can. And your, your fullest, deepest understanding of God will come in tier two with yellow and with turquoise. Next question. Why does God need to self-realize? Well, of course, the answer is God doesn't. God is perfectly fine with living a life that's not self-realized in a certain sense. But also in another sense, like I said earlier, God's whole point is just to be, to exist, and to experience itself, to live through all of its possibilities. And of course, to realize what it is. So, of course, it's living through the possibility of your current life, but unless you awaken in this current life, you won't experience what it's like to live an awake life as an awake human being. And you won't fully understand what God is. Um, there's certain ways and things that you can understand about God only because you're in this human form that you couldn't if you were a dog or a worm or something like that. So make sure that you, you use it. Um, but there's no need for you to do it. It's just like if you want to. Next question. Is God personal or impersonal? The answer is both. This is hard for people to understand. So what do we mean by personal versus impersonal? Well, the atheist has a very impersonal view of the universe. The atheist thinks the universe is just like an impersonal object. Atoms are not personal. And so the atheist is very opposed to any kind of personal notions of reality or existence as though existence is somehow here for the benefit of mankind or that existence has any kind of human personal qualities to it. And in a certain sense, that's right. The Godhead itself is impersonal in the sense that it doesn't have any kind of human personal qualities. But at the same time, it's also deeply personal because it's you. You are it. This Godhead is you. It's inside of you right now being conscious of all of this. You see? Um, and the universe does have human qualities in a certain sense. Because this intelligence that you're experiencing right now as you're sitting here listening to me, uh, the emotions you feel, the, the laughter and all the human qualities that you exhibit... Um, the universe 
has these qualities. It's not that a human being has these qualities. It's no, it's the universe is taking on human qualities. In a sense, the universe has all qualities. But when you're a human, it's especially got human qualities. And so you got to you got to integrate the personal and the impersonal together. It's very it's a very personal experience when you become fully conscious of who you are as God. Very personal experience. And yet at the same time, there's a sense of no self, a sense of transcending your biological, biographical self. So that's sort of the paradox. Next question. Does God take an active role in manipulating our lives? Um, again, it sort of depends on what you mean by God here. If you mean the Godhead itself, then not really. No. The Godhead is just a very passive. It just sits and observes. It doesn't really do anything. But at the same time, the God is not really different from all the form that is here. And all the thoughts you're having, this is all the work of God. Your whole body, everything that's going on here, all your thoughts, your emotions, your plans for your life, your ambitions on all this, this is God sort of using the body as a puppet to do its bidding. So in a certain sense, it is manipulating your life all the time. Next question, does God have an agenda or a plan for the universe? Where is creation going? Again, all of these answers basically have this sort of double-sidedness to them. In a certain sense, God has no agenda or plan for the universe. There is no purpose or point of the universe other than the being of the universe. You see, being is its own point. Being is its own purpose. Just to be is all that really the universe is doing. But at the same time, there's also that evolutionary process that's unfolding, especially from our perspective as humans. It definitely seems like the universe is evolving and moving towards greater complexity, greater self-awareness. And it seems reasonable to me to assume that that's going to keep happening. And so I would assume that what's happening is that God is becoming more and more complex, experiencing itself in more and more forms, and ultimately sort of reaching to a singularity or to an infinity, in the sense that you might imagine that in like 10,000 years from now, we could imagine that all of humanity is linked together through some kind of neural networks, and we're integrating our brains and our minds with computers and with AIs, and all of it is merging together into just one giant hive-like hypermind which is able to um, experience life through all sorts of different sensory modalities. And it's able to, you know, query Wikipedia pages, take that knowledge, stick it inside of its computer mind and combine it with its calculating mathematical knowledge, like a calculator, like a supercomputer. It's able to crunch numbers like crazy, but also it's able to feel emotions the way that a human can. All of it is kind of integrated in all of the experiences of every human being and every living creature on the entire planet is all linked together into this ultimate, like, um, singularity. Maybe it's heading towards something like that. That's what I would imagine. Next question. Which is more true, pantheism or panentheism? So, pantheism says that everything is God. All of reality is God. Panentheism is a slightly different version of that which says that everything, all of reality, is inside of God, which is a very slight little distinction. And really, it's kind of a distinction without a difference. In reality, both are true. It's true that everything, absolutely everything, is God, but at the same time, everything is inside of God because God is the Godhead, the formlessness, that is sort of the background against which all the form is happening. Yet at the same time, the formlessness is not different from the form. The form and the formlessness are identical. So really, it kind of depends a little bit on your perspective on how you're looking at it. And 
when you're becoming conscious and awake to these things, you might at first experience it as though it's pantheism, and then you might experience it separately as panentheism, and then you might also experience it both as, as both of them simultaneously in a kind of a superposition overlapping each other. That's the paradoxical nature of non-duality. Uh, next question. How did mankind first learn about God? Well, of course, I don't know for sure. I don't have perfect historical knowledge of uh, human history, but I can take a guess. I can speculate. I think mankind has known about God, like I said, for over 450,000 years, since the very beginning of modern humans, and maybe even before that. Maybe even before there were modern humans, our anthropoid ancestors, even they might have had some uh, mystical insights into God. But basically, the way I think it happened is probably a combination of things. I think people, human beings, used to be more spiritual in the past, and so it probably was even easier for them to access God. Also, you know, 400,000 years ago, what was there to do? There was no television. There was no distractions. There weren't a lot of humans even, so there wasn't a lot of war going on. There wasn't farming. There wasn't much to do. So um, human beings sat around a lot, and effectively what they were was meditating as they were sitting around and doing nothing. And so I think many of them had spontaneous mystical experiences. Uh, I also think that they used psychedelics because psychedelics are readily available on all continents around the entire world. And um, herbalism and shamanism, we know, dates back tens of thousands of years at least that we have good historical evidence for. So that shamanism probably dates back all the way to 450,000 years ago. And also remember that some people are just naturally spiritually gifted when they're born, whether it's genetics or whatever, however you want to explain it through past lives or whatever. So some people are just naturally born and they have spontaneous awakenings. And so I think that um, <laughs> before there was Jesus, before there was Buddha, there were thousands of Jesuses and Buddhas that date back for hundreds of thousands of years that just nobody knows about because they've been long forgotten because there were no books, there was, there was no writing back then. And so this stuff, you know, people had these realizations, but they probably weren't able to communicate it very well. Or it was just kept very locally within their little tribe. And then once their tribe died out, then all that knowledge died out with them. And it was only later once we got systems of writing with the ancient Egyptians and so forth, that we finally started to codify um, these insights and turn them into various kinds of religious and mystical schools and systems. Next question. Why did God decide to take on my particular human form? Well, God is taking on every possible form simultaneously, one of which is this particular human form that you're in. So don't take it too personally. God's doing everything at once. Next question. Why did God create humans and animals? Again, because God is everything that's possible. So it's going to take on every possible form that it can. Humans, animals, aliens, AIs, and a million other things that you can't even possibly imagine yet. It's doing all of it simultaneously. And um, I think to it, humans and animals are especially um, valuable because you get to actually experience what that's like to be some creature or some sentient entity in a way that you can't really do with an atom or with a rock. But of course, God is also atoms and rocks. It's just that atoms and rocks are so simple that there's not enough complexity there to really create a rich experience. But you know, in the form of a human, God can experience all sorts of things. Laughter, uh, jealousy, uh, sexuality, love, emotions that rocks and even other animals can't experience. So it seems that generally speaking, this evolution is creating more and more complex life forms 
which can experience reality in richer and richer ways, richer senses, um, richer emotional capacities, richer intellectual capacities, richer uh, conceptualization abilities with language and with religion and culture and entertainment and all of this. So it seems like that's going to keep going. And whatever comes after humans, you can imagine it's going to be like a step above in the same way that humans are a step above animals in their ability to interface with the universe. Next question. How can the realization of God be used from the human perspective? This is a bit tricky because the ego loves to ask this question and, and loves to think about how you can use God to earn money or sex or something like that. And of course you can. People have used the realization of God to become famous and to become successful and to earn money and to get sex and write books and do tours and become a celebrity. Yeah, you can do all that. That would be very, uh, um, very tricky, though, because you can get easily lost in all those materialistic trappings. But you can use the realization of God from the human perspective to elevate the consciousness of mankind. So once you yourself become awake, it becomes very easy and effortless for you to transmit that awakeness to everybody around you. And uh, this helps to wake up the rest of the world. You can use the realization of God to teach. You can use it to master your emotions. You can use it to improve, for example, how you do science. Uh, you can use it to be hyper-creative. You can become a really great artist from this place. It will improve every aspect of your life. You can use it to become a better athlete. You can use it to become a better father or mother. Um, you can use it to raise a better family. You can use it to improve the quality of your relationships and your sex life and many other things. Basically, consciousness helps to improve everything you do. You can even use it to improve your ability to run a business. Of course, that sort of assumes that you're going to be running a conscious business. If you're running a very unconscious business, where you're fleecing people and gouging people, hurting people, then that's probably not going to be compatible with awakening. But you can transform your business into a conscious business. Same thing with your relationships. If you're inside of very toxic, dysfunctional relationships, then awakening will probably end those relationships. But then you can forge new relationships, which, which will be much healthier and more conscious. Next question. Does realizing God give you any special powers or abilities? This is a bit of a dangerous question, because the answer is that yes, it can. It can. This is the realm of uh, paranormal abilities and cities what the yogis call cities, these special spiritual powers that you can get. So these are the powers that have been written about in various spiritual books, magical healing abilities, clairvoyance, telepathic abilities, and uh, abilities to see auras and other things like this. So this is a whole separate subject matter that can be studied in a lot of depth. It can also become a big distraction to awakening. The pursuit of these powers is usually sought by an ego, which can be very problematic because the ego is hungry for power. But, uh, but yeah, some people do develop these abilities. These abilities are real, but you're not guaranteed to develop any particular ability. And most people who awaken probably won't develop any abilities, but some people will. I think that genetic predisposition has something to do with it and um, other factors that I don't quite understand yet. Next question. Are miracles possible? Um, well, first you have to realize that everything is a miracle. Literally, this very moment right now is a miracle. All of existence is a miracle. But that's not what you're asking. You're asking, can, can miracles happen within this physical reality? And... Uh, the answer is that I think 
yes, in the sense of paranormal stuff can happen. Certain paranormal healing can happen, which is very well documented. Um, certain synchronicities can happen, and synchronicities are kind of a weird thing that are difficult to explain unless you're already awake and you're experiencing them. So in this sense, miracles can sort of happen, um, but um, I also think it can be kind of over-exaggerated. I don't really know if Jesus walked on water uh, and this sorts of stuff. I wouldn't really pay too much um, credence to that. But stuff like, for example, healing people, I think, is, is definitely uh, possible. Next question. So, is everything in the Bible false? The answer, of course, is no. There's a lot of good stuff in the Bible, but also a lot of outdated stuff. There's racist stuff in there, ethnocentric stuff, closed-minded stuff. There's factually incorrect stuff, because the Bible was written by humans, and it wasn't even written by Jesus. So you should expect that there would be a lot of inaccuracies and errors in the Bible. But at the same time, there's really good stuff. Like there's a passage in the Bible that says where, where Moses, Moses communicates with God, he sees God, and then he asks God, okay, so I'm going to go back to my people and tell them that I saw God, but what should I call you? And God tells him, you can tell them that I am. My name is I am. And that's a really good passage. Very, uh, very accurate. That tells you exactly what God is. I am. You are. You are God. Uh, when Jesus said that the kingdom of heaven is found within, that's a really good pointer to where you find heaven. Within. Nirvana is found within. Heaven is not outside of you. So you can find all sorts of little interesting clues and, and pointers in the Bible. Um, but at the same time, you know, uh, there's a lot of fluff in the Bible, a lot of misleading stuff, so I wouldn't consider it a, a really high-quality, uh, practical spiritual text. You can find much better modern books that will teach you how to actually do the practices of being able to realize what the Bible is pointing to. Next question. What is our duty towards God? What should we do? Should we worship God? Should we pray to God? Well, in the ultimate sense, you have no duty towards God. Since you are God, what duty can you have to yourself? Your duty is simply to just be. However you are is you fulfilling your duty. Whether you're a monster or you're an angel, you're fulfilling your duty. Um, in another sense, your duty is to awaken and to help to raise the awareness of all of mankind and to help to raise the awareness of the entire cosmos and to participate in this creative evolutionary game that God is playing in. Should you worship God or pray to God? The problem with this that I find is that people who worship God or pray to God are doing it under the presumption of a duality between God and themselves. So you need to make sure you realize that the thing you're worshiping or praying to is exactly yourself. So really, when you're worshiping or you're praying, it is a form of masturbation. And you should be conscious of that. And then if you still want to worship or pray, I don't really know why you would. I guess you could. But this is a classic mistake that many uh, Orthodox religious people make, is that they, they just... They worship God so much that that then becomes the obstacle to realizing that I am God. Because, you know, Leo, if I've been worshiping God for 20 years, what the hell was I worshiping if I was just worshiping myself? Well, exactly. Exactly. That's the whole point. There's nothing to worship but yourself. So, careful with that. Next question. What does God want from us? Well, again, really nothing. Just be however you want to be, and God's happy with it. Whatever you do, God is fine with it. doesn't matter. But in another certain sense, try to be as conscious as you can. Try to appreciate your own magnificence as God. Otherwise, it's sort of like you're, 
you're not realizing how amazing you are, how amazing this whole thing is. You're kind of missing the beauty of life. It's wasted on you. It's almost like we're going to a really great movie and we're sitting down in the theater to, to watch the movie. And instead of sitting, pointing your face at the movie screen, you turn around and look backwards at the projector the whole time. And of course, in a certain sense, it's like you're wasting this opportunity. If you would just turn around and look the right direction, you would see a really beautiful movie. So why are you getting in your own way? But at the same time, also, if you want to sit backwards, that's also fine. God doesn't really care. There's a certain uh, point in doing that, too. Then you get to experience what the back of the movie theater is like. Next question. Will following my religion lead me to God? Should I abandon my religion? I'm sort of biased, actually, against religion. I have an allergy against any kind of dogma or fundamentalism or any belief system whatsoever. I'm... I'm even uh, allergic to ideologies, secular ideologies, economic ideologies, and political ones, and so forth. So, personally, I recommend that you do abandon your religion, because it's mostly going to get in the way. Have the courage just to let it go. After all, it's just brainwashing is all that it really is. You can never lose the only true thing there is, which is God. So, if you really care about your religion, and you really care about God, then abandon your religion. And then you will discover that all that there is is God. And you won't need a religion anymore. Your religion will become the real thing. God, you, you are the source or the thing that religion is pointing at. Nothing but you. So why do you need all those belief systems? Try to let them go as much as you can. Next question. Leo, my religion like the Quran, the Bible, Buddhism, Vedanta, already says all the stuff you're talking about. It's already filled with all the wisdom. So what's the point of your teachings? Aren't you just rehashing the same stuff? Plagiarizing them? Uh, no. It, it might seem like I'm rehashing the same stuff, but actually I'm talking about it at a different level. I'm actually talking about it at a higher level. I'm talking about it from a stage yellow, stage turquoise perspective, from an integral holistic perspective in a way that the Quran or the Bible doesn't. The problem with the Quran, with the Bible, with traditional Buddhist sutras and even traditional Vedanta is that it's a very ethnocentric version of spirituality. It's not truly holistic. It doesn't take into account all the different other spiritual schools that exist. It tries to be exclusive. It also is dogmatic. It teaches you certain things that it wants you to believe and just to take on blind faith. It's not very empirically based. It's also not very well integrated with modern science. And so while all those traditions are great and you can glean certain insights from them, really, in the 21st century, you need to be going beyond. There's a lot of stuff that these thousand-year-old spiritual traditions just will not teach you because those things weren't known back then. We have modern psychological insights, modern insights from quantum mechanics, from uh, chaos theory, from sociology, anthropology, history, economics, um, linguistics, modern philosophy, postmodernism, mm, Uh, you know, there's just there's, there's so much stuff beyond what you will learn in the Quran or in the Bible or through classical Buddhism or Vedanta. Uh, and we need to do that. We need to we need to be constantly evolving our spiritual practice. We can't be living in a spiritual tradition of a thousand years ago. That's way too medieval. It's not going to work in our modern world. You always have to adopt your spiritual practice to fit the modern world and to deal with new technological realities and complexities that just didn't exist back then because the entire universe is evolving and it's evolving at an ever-accelerating rate. So my teachings are really 
trying to be the cutting edge of spirituality. I'm trying to teach spirituality in a way that I think it needs to be evolved into in the 21st century. So even though I speak about a lot of timeless truths, I also do put a new twist on it and I point out important traps that you won't learn about in many other places. For example, are you going to read about cult dynamics in the Bible or in the Quran or within Buddhism or Vedanta? No, you're not. They're not going to teach you about cults because that's more modern psychological theory, um, which we've learned recently. Or, for example, spiral dynamics. You know, the Quran is not going to teach you about spiral dynamics. And that's, that's a great problem. The Quran is also not going to teach you about various kinds of psychopathologies and um, shadow work and other things that weren't known back then, which are really important for, for you to, to be successful in your practice today. Next question. What is the number one requirement for realizing God? I've thought about this for a long while. And I came up with, actually with three important requirements. Number one is concentration. You need to develop laser-focused concentration abilities for hours on end. Number two is radical open-mindedness. You need to literally open your mind so much that you even open your mind to death, to evil, to all the stuff that you resist and would never even imagine is possible. And third is you need to be Genuinely, metaphysically curious. This is so important because you've got to actually have a desire to want to understand what is existence and why is it here and why is there something rather than nothing and what is God. You have to really want to get to the bottom of those answers, not as beliefs or theories, but actuality. So those, I think, are the three keys Next question. But Leo, how do I know that I can trust everything that you're saying? And of course, the answer here is that you shouldn't just blindly trust me. That's one way in which the stuff that I teach is different from the Quran or the Bible or Buddhism or something else. You shouldn't blindly trust me. You should um, validate everything that I'm saying here. Cross-reference, read different sources, Verify things for yourself, experiment with psychedelics, experiment with yoga, experiment with meditation, experiment with self-inquiry, and so on, and discover what's true for yourself. Some of the things I'm saying could be wrong. I could be deluded from your point of view. I could be a cult leader. I could be insane. You don't know. You must verify. But at the same time, also don't mistrust me in a cynical sort of way as well. That would also be a mistake. Because if you mistrust me to too much, then you're not going to give your, yourself enough open-mindedness to even kind of like bootstrap yourself out of whatever situation in life right now that you're stuck in. You need to, um, you need to have kind of like mm, enough openness that you're willing to consider these possibilities seriously and follow up with them and to actually test them in the same way that a good scientist can't be so mistrustful that he can't even run an experiment for a few years and get the results back. He has to be able to have enough trust to run the experiment and then to, to either confirm or to disconfirm what's being said. So that's the end of the list. Those are all your questions. Still confused <laughs> after all this? Well, God is a very confusing topic. But you also have to understand that in the end, all these conversations that we're having about God, all these answers that I'm giving you, it's just story. You're never going to figure out God through this sort of question and answer thing. This question and answer stuff can go on forever. Your mind loves to ask questions because it's a great way to avoid doing the actual work. And the answers, at some point, they become an obstacle because your mind gets filled with all these answers, but you're not actually discovering them for yourself. It's like looking up the answers in the back of a book for your math problems rather than solving them yourself. So in the end, 
the only way to understand God is to awaken to God, to become God, and then to, to look and to feel yourself as God, and then from that will come all the answers. Remember that you cannot awaken before you awaken. Some people try to get like a preview of God. They try to find out, oh, what's God going to be like? I want an image of it. I want a metaphor. I want this. I want a map. I want a model. I want like, what's it going to be like when I awaken? You can't do that. <laughs> if you truly knew what it would be like to awaken, you'd already be awake. That's the whole challenge of awakening. So um, just try to be comfortable with not knowing for a while while you're doing your practices and then trust that one day you'll figure it out when it actually comes. But if you try to get a sneak preview of it, that's actually going to get in the way of you awakening. And the last thing that I'll just remind you of is that one awakening is not enough to understand that everything I told you in this mini-series. I have described God in many different facets in many different ways, from many different angles, which took me over a dozen separate awakening experiences to piece together. And it probably will for you as well. I highly doubt, and I think you'll be very disappointed if you go in to this process expecting to understand everything that I talked about in these two episodes after one awakening experience. I just find that very difficult to believe. It's way too much for you to understand it all with one experience. You're probably going to need multiple glimpses, and then you're probably going to also need to spend time thinking about it, integrating it, um, maybe reading some books, maybe talking to a guru, kind of figuring stuff out in your mind before you really understand it at the level that I described it here in the last two episodes. This is... This is a very thorough, comprehensive explanation that probably many Zen monks and yogis, uh, unless they're super masterful, they won't know all this stuff. They probably will be missing some of these facets because it's hard to have this many awakenings. Most people have one or two awakenings in their whole life if they're lucky. Not a dozen or 30 of them, which is again why psychedelics can be so beneficial because you can use psychedelics to create 30 awakenings for yourself over the next couple of years, which would be virtually impossible through other methods. But of course, yoga and self-inquiry can also basically do the job. So don't feel like you have to do psychedelics. It's just an option. All right, that's it. I'm done here. Please uh, click the like button for me and come check out actualize.org. That's my website. You'll find resources there like my blog, the uh, book list, the life purpose course, and the forum. The final thing that I'll say is that actualize.org can help you to discover God. Uh, I receive emails and private messages on my forum every month of people who have awoken. Maybe not fully awoken, but they had some kind of glimpse or even a significant awakening from following the stuff that I say, doing the practices that I talk about, maybe reading some of the books that I recommend on my book list, um, and just getting on with the program. So if you're serious about understanding God for yourself experientially, then uh, follow along. Try to do the actual practices that I recommend. I recommend some very powerful practices. I'm sort of a no-nonsense kind of guy, and I like to do techniques that actually work, that don't waste my time. And I've spent a lot of time experimenting over the last three years with various kinds of techniques. Um, and I think some of the techniques that I offer are some of the most potent techniques that you'll find anywhere within spirituality. So don't take them for granted. Take them seriously. And... Um, it doesn't always take that long. I have people who have been meditating for six months or 12 months and they're already having awakening experiences. You know, So don't create limiting beliefs for yourself. Don't tell yourself it's going to take 10 years. It doesn't have to. You can, you can awaken within a couple of years if you're serious about it. 
So I recommend you get started and then stick around for more as I will be helping to guide you in the future, pointing out various kinds of traps that you'll be falling into, giving you various other kinds of pointers, sharing other techniques that I'm still researching. There are techniques that I haven't shared yet with you. Um, I'm always looking for cutting edge stuff. That's what excites me about this work. I don't like rehashing old stuff. I like talking about new stuff, which is why I'm always doing lots of research. And uh, there'll be a lot of that coming in the future.